Run! Go! Get to the jibber jabber! Hey Valerie! It's on Apple Podcasts and Podomatic! Freaking awesome! Welcome to this week's episode of the Jibber Jabber Podcast. A special episode where we are joined by none other than Kevin Wells and... And... Stephen McCall. Kevin, who is Stephen McCall? Stephen McCall is a great Scottish actor from movies such as Ned's, The Wee Man. He was in Outlaw King. He's he's actually coming up in an episode of Outlander. He's also been in Tell Us Jordan. He was in a movie called Crying with Laughter, which is an absolute cracker. It's a cracker of a film. It's about a really fucked up stand up comedian. And he's really fucked up Palfy school. Like, everybody's got that fucked up Palfy school. Kevin, if I went to school with you, you'd be him. In which way am I fucked up, J-Mac? Moving on. Um... Aye, exactly. You're more <laughs> fucked up than me, motherfucker. <laughs> There's too much swearing in this. There's so much swearing during this interview with him. I think we should maybe curtail our swearing at the start of the episode. Well, what it would be think? easy to do if you weren't insulting me, you prick. He said, you thought he said prick. He actually called me a prink. Prank, I. <laughs> Do you remember that for the Shaun of the Dead um, DVD extras? They did this thing where they replaced all the swear words with the word prank instead of prick and funk instead of fuck. It's one of the funniest funking things I've ever seen. It's no, really... I, I don't recall that, you prank. <laughs> I mean, funk yourself. Uh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, St- Steve McCall, um, he, he's been about for a while. He was in the Acid House, which is obviously a, a Scottish classic. It's fucking mental. If you've never seen it, make sure you check it out. Um, like Kevin said, he was in The Wee Man. He played Arthur Thompson Jr. Uh, he was in a Band of Brothers. He's been in, uh, actually, a lot of stuff. Uh, Rushmore, uh, directed by Wes Anderson. That had people like... Jason Schwartzman in it. It was uh, like Bill Murray. It's it's kind of was at that time where you think fucking hell, that's a proper Scottish guy in a proper American movie, just playing a Scottish guy. And he is, he is. I checked it out. He's just like (laughs) there's a bit where he just goes, Fisher, your spotty wee dick. (laughs) It's just it's the most Scottish thing you've ever heard. Anyway. Um, so he was gracious enough to give us his time. He came to my house. We sat in this room that I'm in right now, and we just basically talked about his his life and career for about an hour and a half, and it was an absolute blast. Um, we're hoping to have him back on at some point soon, not to talk about himself. He's going to just do a jibber jabber. He's just mm-hmm. going to sit with us and talk the same shit that we do, and we're just going to put it out there, and hopefully people will love it. So, aye, it's uh, it was a it was a great experience, and everybody that was there enjoyed it, including Stephen. Um, and also, I meant to say this: uh, he mentioned that he was he was in this uh, TV show called High Times. Uh, he mentioned it during he mentions it during this podcast. I started watching it. It might actually be one of my favourite shows. <laughs> I swear, I swear to God. Um, I texted him earlier on today. I was like, Stephen, I was like, I've never fucking watched this, and it's it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> it's really good. But it's 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 like a comedy drama set in a block of high rise flats. And wait a minute, is that that thing? Because I saw uh, an advert years ago that had me screaming for ages, right? And it was that. It, it was basically this, right? A, a delivery guy came to the door, and he's like, "Here, that's two pound eighty And the guy hands him like a tenner, and he says, "Here, keep a change." And he's like, Are "You sure?" He's like, "Aye." So he's like, oh, thanks. And he looks, he holds it up and looks to see if it's fake. And the guy goes, what are you doing? He goes, oh, you can't be too careful these days. And he goes, is that right, aye? Change. <laughs> well, and I asked myself, is that it? Because I Stephen think it McC- sounds like it. Stephen McCall is the guy who went, change. No way. <laughs> no way. Fuck off. I is swear to right? God. Yes. Mate, I remember I... that advert from ages ago. And I, and I used to quote it all the time. That's fucked up that I didn't know that. Before it really time. is. Uh, Stephen, if you're listening, sorry about Kevin's fucking ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> to be fair, I've just prank. seen it as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, I, I remember that show. I never actually got to see it. 
because it was at the time when TV wasn't on demand, and I just missed it on the telly. And at that point, I, 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 I said it. I said it to, to Stephen in my message to him. I said, "Mate, I I can't believe I've not seen this. It's, mm -hmm. it's class." There's another great bit where there's this this husband. It's an ongoing storyline, but this husband and wife. He's a bit of a lazy slob, and she's getting bored, and she's basically like, "Like fuck you, I'm leaving." And she says, she "says You know, in thirteen years of marriage, you've never gave me an orgasm." And do you know what he said? What? I didn't think any wanted one. <laughs> 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 That's banging. <laughs> there's, there's so many, so many good lines, so many good lines in this show. I'm, I was actually, I was watching it just before you called me. Um, I'm still, I'm still getting through it. I'm on season two of the now. It, honestly, it's it's so. You know, the best thing about it is the realism of it. Like, see when you watch River City or something, you you just know that that's not how people in Glasgow talk to each other. Seeing this, it. Yeah. Fucking is, and that's the <laughs> that's the best part about it. Like, there's a bit where this, <laughs> um, you've got Stephen McCall, and uh, he's his flatmate, and there's this wee lassie that lives up the 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 kind of the hall for them, uh, who oh. kind of always just shows up. And <sighs> Stephen McCall's flatmate's a bit of a softy. He keeps letting her come in, and he's like, "Get her, you fuck me. She's she's trouble." <laughs> and then she she chaps on the door after falling out with her mum and dad, and she <laughs> she's. She says, she's like, can I stay here the night? <laughs> and Rab, who's played by Stephen McCall, goes, can you fuck? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I digress. It's, it's, wee, it's wee things like that. that yeah. It's it's so realistic, just the way they talk to each other, the, the kind of hardships that, that come with living in that kind of situation. Um, and, and just the conversation flows so naturally. Like Every conversation they have, you're like, I've, I've had that. I've had that conversation with somebody at some point in my life. So well Hi, written. You and your wife, you've never given me an orgasm. I didn't care you want it, one. Ha <laughs> ha you prank. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I speak to your wife, anybody I know. I know. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, um, if you've never seen it, just like I hadn't until the last couple of days, if you've never seen it, you have to watch High Times. Um, yeah. that's, that's to you, Kevin, and anybody that's listening. Watch High Times. It's absolute class. It's a Where class act. Watching it. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's on YouTube. Is that where you're watching it? YouTube. I'm watching it on YouTube. It's on uh, a channel that I've actually been a uh, patron of for quite a while called Stan Scottish Comedy, mm. um, and it's got a lot, of, a lot of Scottish comedy on it because it's called Stan Scottish Comedy. And you can uh, watch that chronologically on YouTube then. Aye, if if you if you finish the first episode, it will move you on to the next. That's fine. Well, make sure to go and check that out on YouTube. Um, moving to a uh, business business part of the the podcast here. Um, the cinema viewing for G Tom Mac and the Lost Boys on the twenty seventh of this there of this here month uh, is almost sold out, and there's very very few tickets remaining. So if you want to go ahead and book your ticket, come along, meet G Tom Mac, watch him perform songs from a Lost Boys musical, the story of a Lost Boys, which is a prequel to the movie, by the way. So if you want to come along and see him do the you know the soundtrack to that and many other things, make sure to call the Bathgate Cinema and just say, look, I know you won't. You know, I know you can't buy a ticket online for whatever dodgy reason or whatever scam you are pulling, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to cut that out. I <laughs> <Aye>, watch me. <laughs> they don't listen to it anyway. They don't even reply to our yep. fucking messages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go. <laughs> um, so, if you want to go ahead and book a ticket through their 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 phone service or however it is they're doing it in 19 fucking 40, um, you go to zero seven five one nine double nine five eight two seven. Um, so. So go ahead and book the tickets that we will see absolutely zero money for in order to this event on for all the other guys to take all the cash. So make sure you go ahead because we want to make it perfect. But on a serious note, you guys being there is going to be perfect for us because we're filming the documentary there. Um, so that really is our reward for that um, marvellous show you guys are going to be part of. So come along, scream the house down, um, make sure you're like one of those wacky waving and flailing, arm flailing tube men. You know, those big things with arms that wave because um, that's what we need to see to, uh, you know, for when we're filming the documentary. So come along to that. It's going to be amazing. Thanks to everybody that already have bought their tickets. You guys are in for a treat. J Mac. It's hard to say J Mac and G because it just so happens G Tom Mac 
as who we talked every day because we're filming his documentary. And J Mac, that isn't even his fucking name, is called J Mac. By the way, that is becoming my name. I know it's your name. It's not. It's slowly becoming my my name. This this was just a Facebook name I had because, oh, fuck it, I've spoken about it before. But in my town where I live now, I am known as J Mac. It's got the same number of syllables in it as Jordan, right? But they all know me as J Mac, so I'm J Mac. And it's like I swear, I swear to God, they say things like, "Is J Mac coming around tonight?" It, it's 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 just they don't even call me J. Uh-huh. It's, my name's not J. As far as they're concerned, my first name is J Mac, and it's it, it, I'm actually it, it's quite endearing. I'm I'm starting to like it, and I think it might just stick. It so, might just stick. Nice. It, it so. might it might just stick. So without further ado, let's get into this special, very special episode. <laughs> without further ado, let's get into this special, very special episode with Stephen McCall, where he came to my house <laughs> to record a podcast. Kevin, roll the tape. Stephen, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. No, no, no worries. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, sure. <laughs> came all the way to my house. This is came all the way to your house. Oh, right. I'll give you the receipt for my petrol money. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Seventeen pence a mile. Seventeen, 17 pence a mile. I think that's the standard. Eh? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, so, uh, you obviously you, you've come from Glasgow and you've been there for. All your days. Since I was born, yeah. I have never moved anywhere else. I've, I've only ever managed to get maybe like two miles away from where I was born. <laughs> I've tried. I fuck, I've tried, but I, you know, I'm always gravitating there. It's kind of where my family are. Uh, I've never been tempted to go to London or, or do any of that. You know, if I was going to go somewhere, I'd go further than that. I would, probably away. I would go away, away. <laughs> the fucking moon or something. <laughs> uh, it might not be far away. It might not be. Uh, more likely Mars. Like, oh, fuck, I don't know about that. <laughs> seen Total Recall. Uh, I've seen it, exactly. You grew up in Castlemilk. I did. I uh, learned that for your radio show, which is on Castlemilk. I do mention it quite a lot. <laughs> 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 it's, it's like scarred me for life growing up there. <laughs> My folks still stay there. I, I, you know, we left and, and then they moved back up. After I had left home, but I, I, all my family are still there. I, I, I had family there when, when I was coming up. I always grew up away from here, but... Uh, it was my, my uncle and cousin, that, they, were all, they were all there, and then they moved to Burnside, right. which isn't too far away. No, again, not again, it's, 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 it's still outside, though, <laughs> it's, it's far enough. Uh, that's, that's, that's the main thing. Now, obviously, you your first passion was dance, I understand. Uh, it, it, well, it was it was acting, first of all, but doing like uh, musicals and stuff when I was, right. when I was young, uh, a thing called the Glasgow Schools Youth Theatre. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, in... My teacher at the time told us about it. I think it was probably in about third year or something. And she went, you're quite good. You should go and check this out. So we went and you had to get a bus out in Mary Hill and walk through <laughs> this horrible, dangerous waste ground to get to <laughs> St. Columba of Iona School that sat in the middle of this kind of waste ground. And uh, yeah, I thought it was a good idea at the time. And I went along with a couple of mates for school who <clears> were uh, you know, a lot kind of more streetwise and wider than I was. And we walked in and it was just like, wow, are these kids just dancing and singing and, oh, and <laughs> prancing about and we were like you'd get murdered for this walking about Casimir you know what I mean You're like does anybody going to see me you know you had to get over that that initial uh, fear of uh, of people watching you what they would think of you and it was a great place for that you know and then so you get singing lessons you got dance lessons uh, you, you did musicals maybe t- two musicals a year wow. and uh, folks would come and see it and it was great you know but through that I got really into the dance thing and then did a, did a couple of a big kind of dance things with a guy called Royston Muldoon who, who went around, he did it in Germany, he did it, he did it all over the world. He would go and he would find uh, groups of kids, young kids and primarily disadvantaged uh, kids, kids from a certain background and, and work on them with them with this, these pieces of classical music and you would then perform it and do these huge dance numbers for like an hour, an hour and a half. So it was proper like contemporary ballet would teach you right. in a short space of time and it was discipline and it was... So yeah, I loved it. I loved all that stuff, you know? And then I was asked, I was given the brochures for Ballet Rombert and and they were like, you could you could go, you should go and do that. I went, fuck, no way. <laughs> I just looked at the pictures and at the things the guys were doing and I was like, that's never going to happen. That's never going to happen. I think I'll go where I can drink and smoke and stuff and become an actor instead. Oh, so, it sounds like a plan. Yeah. It tell us about you getting stopped by the cops with your... Uh, oh, with my ballet stuff, with my, with my gear. And, <laughs> well, I, we lived in Crawford at the time. 
and uh, you know, I would go and do my dance thing, and then I would I would get the bus home, and it would be seven eight o'clock at night. It was a dark winter's night, and I'm walking down past Kings Park to the house, and I get pulled over with the cops, and they were like, ah, "Where have you been?" And I was like. How? <laughs> they didn't want to say dance class. <laughs> <laughs> how? How what is it? And they were like, ah, cause some somebody's been had my big bag with me, and somebody's been robbing houses about here. <laughs> Go up against the motor and uh, they open up a van. Like, what's this? Oh, it's my dance gear, <laughs> you know, and they, and, they were, and then they just start dance gear. They, you know, they'd rather I was a house robber than a dancer. So they started taking the piss out of me, like a pair of pricks that they were, and then oh, just like, on you, on you go, twinkle toes, and told me to get him. You know, went down the road and told my dad, he's like, oh, fucking bastards, bastards. And my boy wants to be a fucking dancer, be a fucking dancer if he wants. So were your parents always supportive of that? Um, I never really expected or asked for any kind of support or you know they certainly didn't push me into anything or you know it was like where's he or he's away to dance class or he's away to a drama thing or, or, or whatever you know was, you know they, they were fine with it like, you know my mum used to come and see all my shows my dad never really bothered his arse <laughs> you know he'd made important things to do I suppose you know and it wasn't until much later on when I was actually earning money and doing it as a job, you know, that they went, oh, right, okay, that's interesting, that's going to be an actual career. My dad for years would just go, fucking get a real job. That's like our wife's. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my wife's now. No, no, my wife's very supportive. But yeah, no, they, 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 you know, supportive, yes, never get in the way of what it was I wanted to do with my life, but, you know, we're, we're never uh, involved in that world or, you know, push me into it, took me to classes or did any of that, I did it all off my own back and... Oh, and stuff, you know. I wanted to be an actor ever since I saw uh, Burt Reynolds and uh, and Cannonball Run, oh, right. Uh, right? Because uh, my dad was a bit of a really serious guy, you know, and he, he worked a lot and he drank a lot and he was just like, you know, very rarely saw him really bust a gut laughing, you know. And I remember seeing him watching uh, the, the outtakes at the end of Cannonball Run with Don DeLuise and Burt Reynolds and literally rolling about on the flare, <laughs> crying with laughter. Oh, oh, rewinding it, watching it again. And I was like, the power, the power in that to make a man who's usually so stoic and oh, fucking, yeah. you know, what car, you know, uh, to, to be in a puddle on the floor. Yeah. That, that, was, that was my hero, Burt Reynolds, for making my dad do that you know so if ever, ever since I saw that I was like I'm going to be an actor I'm going to be I'm going to be Burt Reynolds didn't quite work out for that. <laughs> but that's a, that's why I, I wanted to do there's it there's still time to be the next Burt Reynolds Um, you know no there really is I mean I appreciate the, the sentiment I'm still trying to be the first Stephen McCall you know what I mean I've not really mastered that yet oh, no. I in saying that though didn't it take you long to get in the movies looking at your IMDB profile yeah but well, like I never ever thought I was going to be in a film and I always thought one film that's all I wanted to be in that was my aim because if I'm in one film I'll be able to show that to my wange if that was in a film once right. you know that so that that was in the back of my head and I never thought I would be in a film I did like the, uh, kind of community theatre stuff so you know I enjoyed the acting I did it as an amateur when I was young and then all of a sudden somebody paid me to be in a play and I was like God, they actually give me money. I've done this for free for the last ten years, and now I've got a paycheck. This is amazing. And I got an agent through one of those plays. Uh, we won a French first. Where it's called "Don't Start Me," which was amazing. This play it was wrote by Ford Kiernan and his uh -huh. then partner John Paul Leach. Right. Uh, so they used to do a comedy double act at the festival, and they wrote this play for for us today for Cast Milk People's Theatre. Uh, to do and it's called Don't Start Me uh, I do believe the original title of it was there's these two I'm not even going to say it on your podcast <laughs> right but it, let's just say it was I'll a bit of, it. it was a bit of 70s comedian 60s 70s comedian racist sexist homophobic comedian of his time Bernard Manning type guy Aye. who through his life how comedy changes and how he becomes irrelevant over the years, so it spanned maybe 30 years of his life and career, and a guy called Pat Welsh played him, who was not an actor, was a landscape gardener, but was part of the People's Theatre, because it was a community thing, yeah. and they brought me in as a 
an actor that they'd worked with before, a professional, because I'd been paid for the last gig. That was me, a professional <laughs> actor now. So they brought a professional actor in to, to do every other part. So I played maybe 12 or 14 parts, mm-hmm. constantly changing, maybe yeah. just a hat, accent, <laughs> demeanour and stuff. And we won that French first for that. And then it went on at the Citizens Theatre. Right. And then, and my agent, who was my agent for a, for a long, long time, Ann Coulter saw it, and I went up and I want you to be my agent. I've totally brainsed up. And then it's it just it was really lucky. I went up for the right jobs at the right time, and mm-hmm. uh, I got I actually got a, a short film. The very first time I was ever on camera was a short film called Dead Eye Dick, which yeah. is a piece of a work of genius. It's, it's brilliant. It's really really good, and uh, and and from that I was reading uh, the Acid House at the time. So I was sitting in, in the green room, kind of waiting to go, and I was reading the Acid House. Somebody went, "Oh, the producer's making that into a film." And I went, no. Is he really? The whole thing. They went, no, no, just three stories. Uh, the Acid House, Soft Touch, and Grant and Star Cause. And I was actually reading Grant and Star Cause at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was, and I just went up, and they were filming on the roof of the Bird Hall Residence in Suckey Hog Street. And I just walked up to him and I went, I'm going to be Bob Coyle. Wow. The, the, the bravery and the uh, bullshittery of being everywhere. young and you're just getting... Uh, what's, what's the worst that could happen? Right. See, this is this is what he does. Like, he'll just say, I'm just going to fucking ask. And I'm sitting there going... No, if you don't, don't ask, you don't from get... From the start. Absolutely. From the start, since day dot, I always said... You know, because this, there's this idea that, you know, Hollywood and every, every, like people we watch on TV, that they're a mile, million miles away from you. I was like, if you get the opportunity to have that opportunity, Funny. just ask. <laughs> It is as simple as just asking, and like you just said there, you went up and you made it happen. It's that whole, um, you know, the the. Have you read the secret? I haven't. No. Power of positivity. No, I don't read self help well, books. It's, it's not even so much as that. It's about yeah. making what having a vision and just making it happen. If you will it, you know, it, it comes to fruition. Well, I, I agree. With, I agree with the sentiment. Absolutely. You know, it's certainly, and I think as a young man's game, that that level of positivity yeah. and, and bullshittery. <laughs> You know, to walk up to him and go, I hear you're making that film, I want to be that part. I would never do that now. How old were you then? Um, God, that was way back. So I would have been 20, 19, 20 when I did that. Maybe 21 at a push. But within a few years, and then and, I did, and they did, they auditioned me and I got it. And then another job and then another job. And it was a really good first kind of five years. And before I knew it, I was away in America doing Rushmore. I was like 23, yeah. 24 when I did that. So it was a kind of meteoric... Uh, if you you know just just a great kind of learning process to to do all these different films early on, you know. I mean, it, the I, I'm, I've actually never seen Rushmore, but I've seen you right, working. I'm sorry, I, I, I know, I know. I know um, it's I've, actually refreshing to me somebody that's never seen it. <laughs> no, uh-huh. Never seen it. As, I, I mean, I'm a massive film fan. I've just never seen it. Never but, get rid of it. No, I, 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 but I watched your kind of stuff in it. It's like you're a brilliant dick. Yeah, oh, thanks very much. Do you, do you know what I mean? You just you're so good at it, and that the, even the character's name, Magnus Bucking, you know, it sounds like a, a comic book villain. You know what I mean? And I, I think yeah, it, it was it was really it was it must have been it's really unusual to see a character like that in an American film. Back well, then. according to to them, they went to school with a, a Scottish foreign exchange student called Magnus Bucking. Who had one ear? So you just <laughs> who, would, who would make up all these things about why his ear was missing? You'd constantly, you'd ask him one day, and he would say something. I dug chewed it off, and the next day he'd say he'd get shot off when he was hunting an accident. So it was just a fucking bullshitter, you know. Um, but it was interesting because that when I another example of when you're young, you just fucking bring your way into things. You know, you're no worried. You're no got a mortgage. You've no got a wife and wains. You're just, yeah. this is all for you. It's a very personal thing. Mm-hmm. The journey of a young actor, you know what I mean? You make all your own decisions and you'll, you'll live or die on, on them and you don't really have to worry about anybody else. Mm-hmm. So my agent phoned me up one day and says, right, after this an audition for, for this American thing. We're looking for two characters, so come in and uh, wear, a, wear a shirt and a school tie. And I was like, fucking 23 year old, I'm fucking wearing this shirt in my school tie. <laughs> because I did, I did chip still, this chip for Carson was still on my shoulder. I'm like, I'm doing that, fucking doing this, I'm going to do things my own way, you know. <laughs> and uh, I went in and they gave us the script, and the script, Rush was a great script, but the Magnus Bucking character, there was lines like, uh, Fisher, you bleeding little bollocks. And I was like, that's Cockney, that's not Scottish. He says, you can't say that in a Scottish accent, you know what I mean? So I went, I'm not fucking getting this job. There's no way I'm getting this job anyway. <laughs> so there's a young guy that was playing Max Fisher uh, for everybody that was auditioning. Everybody was kind of helping each other. Yep. 
and, uh, and she, he, he just looked, there's your tie, and I mean, he's a school bully, he doesn't he fucking wear a tie. <laughs> and she's like, all right, well, right, fair enough, you know, you've thought, you clearly thought long and hard about this. <laughs> and I, I went up and I just went on a tirade, I didn't do any of the lines, I just started calling a wee guy a fucking prick. You gotta rip off your fucking hidden shit down your neck, you fucking wee arsehole. You fucking slapping them about and ragdolling them and stuff. And then my agent's like, ah, what was that? And I went, well, that's this fuck, that's what I've got, do you know what I mean? I don't really fucking, I can't see these lines. Yeah. And uh, and I got the job, it, it says as soon as he saw that tape, that, that was it. He oh, didn't watch any more. He just he got, got his, came in and watched this, and the other people were going, Who the fuck is this? He's just fucking talking shit. Yeah. Do you never find, sorry, that, like, see when you're watching a movie and it's maybe not made by Scottish people, but it's a Scottish movie, mm-hmm. and you find that they're all ginger and called Angus and <laughs> Sherlock, and and they say, it's like, you can, they, they can sound Scottish, but not necessarily have our lingo. Do you ever do you, do you find you worked in areas, like, have you ever worked in a project where you're like, you're watching the scene on phone, you're like, nah, we wouldn't say that. Yeah, a lot. I mean, right. I find that, I watch it, my but wife If an go, American writes a script and tries to get into the psyche of, and I suppose it's the same in anywhere. If I was to write a script based in Chicago right. and try to write that based on the things that I've seen, mm-hmm. you know, then it would probably be better than what somebody writing a Scottish one. So yeah. the, the wealth of material isn't there mm-hmm. for them to watch and, and yeah, get the part one, get the, get the, the way we speak, you know. <clears throat> But, um, I, you know, I've worked with lots of actors that have tried their fucking damnedest at Scottish accents, and, you yeah. know, and they're brilliant actors, and they're great, and the accent's been just terrible. Aye. Christmas you know, and it's not really my job to go up and say, as another <laughs> actor, as you'll go, excuse me, I don't, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what, just what let it go. Think? That's a good point. What did you think of Chris Pine's attempt? It was really good. So did I. Yeah, I yeah really, it was really I good. Really I mean, listen, I, I think if any American actor gets within the 90 to 95% range, I am over the moon Aye. over the moon with that because it's a hard accent to do mm. I could I probably couldn't get to 90-95% of any American accent and I've done yeah. American accents and things so Aye. you know who am I you know that's the job of acting as long as most people buy it it doesn't really matter yeah. that film was not made for everybody in Scotland to critique his accent yeah, absolutely. you know I, I also like Mel Gibson's accent and, and Braveheart it's a bit endearing um, you know it, it <laughs> is what it is that guy that guy talks like that that's how I say it do you know what I mean that guy's got a bit of a funny voice yeah. and talks like that that's fine <laughs> you know I, I, I you know I, I, if, as long as they're putting the effort in right. you know as long as they're trying I would like I would hopefully that Americans listen to my American accent and Band of Brothers and would be like, <laughs> at least he's given it a go. <laughs> but Band of Brothers, I mean, getting into that, that's I mean, that's timeless now. You know, it's, it's such, it certainly is. It's such I, a it's, legendary it's, it's, show. I still don't believe I was in it. I can't, <laughs> I can't believe it. There's so many people, and you go, I didn't even know he was in that. And you watch it, and you go, oh, aye, that's right. Um, but so many big actors aye. showed up in it just for one episode. <laughs> Really? It's the power of the of the Spielberg and the Hanks in it. I mean, if, if they ask you, you do. Yeah, I think you're going to turn that down, are you? No matter who you are. I mean, you, you've speaking of like Hanks and Spielberg. You've worked with some pretty heavy hitters over the years. Like, um, I mean, you had Last Orders. With Last Orders was bro was a brilliant job. I mean, that was some of my heroes in that. You know, uh, all sitting about in a pub. You know. And uh, and you're kind of hanging about, with them sit there waiting for it to turn over, and they're all just chatting to one another. You know, you Bob Hoskins and Michael Caine and Tom Courtney and David Hemmings are just having a chat, and I'm just sitting there shitting myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just shitting myself, going, I'm going to get fucking found out any second. <laughs> yeah. uh, somebody's going to come in with a hoot and go, "What the That's fuck like are you doing in here?" So like us, you know, <laughs> just waiting to get found out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a it's a lovely film as well. It's a great book, and 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 they did a great job with that film and a, and a great cast. I mean, that's probably that's the that's the one for me where you just kind of pinch yourself, you know, sitting amongst them. Helen Mirren played my ma. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Helen Mirren. I had a thing for Helen Mirren <laughs> like my entire so that <laughs> like my entire life. Oh. And and then she's playing my mom and she was lovely and chatting away and, and she's great and Michael Caine was lovely and, and great and I think these are like my heroes mm-hmm. and I got to sit and do a film with them. So that was your pinch yourself moment. That was the that was the film, you know. That was the one we're going to consume my way and start. Yeah, right. you know what I mean. Uh, I, when I had to do a lot of shit, <laughs> not a lot of shit, not a lot of shit, but no, to do a lot of stuff to get to that that one. That. <laughs> no, I fucking leave it. I did to get to that. You know, the, I did do a lot of work to finally get one where I was literally I was I was 
gobsmacked every single day that I was in there. Mm-hmm. I did a, my first scene with Bob Hoskins. I had to do this this scene with him and, and I'm doing the accent and I'm trying to do Ray Winston's voice and I'm trying to, you know, I had a lot to think about, you have to, you know, but I was so nervous. I rattled through my dialogue so fast that Bob Hoskins <coughs> just went, cut, 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 cut. <laughs> you need to calm down, you need to take a breath. He says, I can't fucking understand what you're saying. <laughs> And I, and I was like, ah, right, sorry, sorry, I'm just a bit nervous. And he went, what are you fucking nervous about? What are you nervous about? You've already got the job. I was like, you're right, so I have. And then we filmed the scene again, and that, that was it, one take, and it was lovely. You know, and he, was, he was really generous and, and really... Sailed your nerves out. Yeah, quickly. totally, you know, because you're there with an absolute fucking legend. You it's know? almost like it's their role to, when, when you're, when you're what, what you would call the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Mentor, the mentor, they're, they're the the Mount Rushmore. And it's almost like they're given back when they, they see, yeah. Well, that's lovely talented. when that happens. It's not always the case, mm. you know. I certainly try and do it myself, not that I'm anywhere near at that level. Do you know what I mean? But who have you worked I've... with that hasn't been like that and has been a bit of a ball bag? <laughs> How long have you got? I need to get up, I need to get up, I up. No, generally, generally, actors are, are very, uh, you know. Uh, but listen, actors are human beings. Uh-huh. All human beings are flawed. Some are cracking people, other people are cunts. Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? And that's the yeah. same on every walk of life. Acting is no different. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? And it's the same behind the camera, front of the camera. Generally, though, I think for the most part, the camaraderie that happens with the making of a film, mm-hmm. it forces you to come together. Mm-hmm. You need to make bonds with people really, really quickly because you're, you're, you're often exposing yourself not literally, but <laughs> figuratively, emotionally, to to people, you know, you're, you're in tears, or you have to fake <clears throat> laugh, you know, you're doing all this, you really have to be comfortable in each other's presence, and for the most part, people do try and make that happen, you know, and I think that 99.99% of people I've worked with are exactly like that, you know. I'm not fucking telling you. <laughs> I might have to work with him again. Sitting there waiting with a name. I'll tell you when the camera's on. <laughs> And obviously, being Scottish, you've been in Taggart. Mm-hmm. The, the one and only Taggart. Twice, two different characters. Two different they characters. do that so often. They do it in yeah. the bill as well. Um, no, I know people that were in Taggart eight times. <laughs> it's different people. Eight ta- it was different people <laughs> eight times. <laughs> That's brilliant. It's like, That's if you leave it long enough, folk will remember. Do you know what? I, I, can, uh, I was, I was <clears throat> not the greatest fan of, of Taggart after Mark McManus died. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you know what? I, Fucking miss it now. I really do miss it. I miss having that on the telly. I miss there's been a murder. Uh-huh. I miss. I miss the characters. I miss the work. The theme tune, man. The, the theme, theme tune. The, that's such such a great theme tune, for, especially for a Scottish program. Yeah. It just grabs you by the balls. You're just like, yes, fucking die. I, <laughs> I, I, I do. I, I miss it, and it's a shame that they don't do something right back. Now, I've got an idea for a tiger, right? If you steal this, I'll know you have stolen. <laughs> but I think, because I do believe that Taggart had kids that then went away to Canada. So I think right. you could get a really shit hot Canadian American actor to come back here. Here is the fucking son of Taggart, hard lined, fucking gun toting. Possibly. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. Executive producer. <laughs> Let's do it. I mean, Taggart's a common name. We do. It's got nothing to do with that show. Exactly. Like Dempsey and Makepeace, remember that? The dude comes out of the American oh. cop. He's fucking running about London with a gun. We could have him coming over like uh, Randy McBadger for Gary Tank Commander. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it would be good to date that or to go back to Taggart as a beat cop. How he became a detective, take it back to the sixties. Like the endeavor sort of thing. Endeavor sort of thing. Aye, right? that's it's not a bad idea, again. is it? Not not really idea. Why are you not doing it? Just, just go out and do it. I'm fucking it. too lazy. I'm too lazy. I'm an ideas man. I'm not an action man. I don't make things happen. I just take part in them when they do. Oh uh, man. Now jumping ahead a wee bit, crying with laughter. Mm. Now I found out. I only found out that our film existed after I'd seen uh, the wee man, and I looked you up. <laughs> and uh, I bought it. I ordered it on Amazon, and it took about two weeks to come. It was uh, it wasn't a you didn't. They were it. actually printing the math <laughs> one by one as people were ordering them. But I, I fucking loved it. Mm. I really did. Uh, it was, Thank you. It was brutal. It, it was a lot of hard work. That was the most hard work, the most work I've ever put into a film, or right. into an idea, because that that came from a meeting with myself. Uh, 
with just Milotnikov and uh, myself and Malcolm Shields, the the other guy in the film, yep. and uh, Justin and I had done a couple of things together. He'd done uh, High Times. He did the last uh, couple of series, couple of episodes of High Times. <laughs> And so we got on really well, and, and you know we we're both big fans of improvisation, the improv techniques. I had my own improv company uh, where we, we would do shows and stuff, right. you know. And I, I just love the idea of being able to make something out of nothing. Aye. So we had this meeting, uh, a meeting in a pub, and they said we've got this idea, and it was a very basic. This is what happens: a guy, two guys have been abused when they're kids. One can't forget it, and the other one doesn't remember it, and they bring the two things together. Yeah. And we're just going to workshop that for about a year. Uh, do as many works you know things as we can so that's it and mm. I was like brilliant so he's like so what does he do for a living so I went oh, what is it? a stand up comedian because I'd, always, because I'd always fancied it I, I used to go to a lot of stand up things stand up at nights <clears throat> and a guy I know Alan Anderson runs uh, used to run a wee night in Shawlands Shaw, in, uh, and uh, we fancied getting out with our decks and kind of playing different wee venues. I've been a DJ since I was kind of in my teens. And uh, we said, well, can we come along and play music before the gig and then in between the acts? And then, you know, and just it's, so then we got to see comedy for free as well. So it was like, great. So we used to go along and do that. And then I would go up and they went, asked me to host it one night. And I went up and I died Mars. <laughs> um, and I always, I, know, I, I always rankled with me how fucking shite I was. On stage with a microphone, you know, I was terrified, and I, and that as soon as he asked me where, where does he do for a living, it popped into the back of my head, and I went, "This is my chance to learn to be a stand up comedian." Because right. you really put the time I, into I that. I did it for that. about a year. Mm-hmm. I I went out and I, I did lessons, That's and right. I, I did every open slot that I could find, and it wasn't it wasn't it to see if I was funny. It was to get the feeling of being a stand-up comedian. What's it like to stand in the wings, shit yourself, go out there, <laughs> die in your ass, come off again, and then do it again? <laughs> How can you put yourself through that? What's the mentality that behind it? Barrage of just getting yeah, your d- kicked. Yeah, right. and, and what, what does that do to your psyche to, to put yourself through that? Because I know quite a few stand-up comedians, and certainly I know a lot more now, and, and, and they were all very generous with their time mm-hmm. with me and the realities of doing it, and... I had the best time doing that, you know. I felt I felt like by the time we started filming, that I was that character. I always went on stage as Joey Frisk. I'd spent That's a right. year doing it as him. Mm. Uh, I was horrible to people. I was fucking horrible to people. <laughs> I'd make people cry on their birthdays <laughs> uh, and gigs, you know. And it was that chance to let that really evil, horrible, funny part of myself loose, you yeah. know. And it and it kind of kind of changed changed a, a big part of I think my own person persona. I took a lot of that on and I kept it. You know, I was like, I want to keep these. All these. I tried to keep all the good bits here and get rid of the bad bits, but some of the bad bits came away as well. You know, I liked your uh, you porn bit. That was pretty funny. Like, no, I, yeah, we, we we sat and we came up with a lot of we came up with a lot of stuff. <clears throat> uh, me and uh, Laura Keenan, who plays my manager in the film, who was a manager of a stand-up comedian who I went and met. So through Laura, I got to go and shadow this guy, Tom Stade, who is oh, a Tom Stade. genius, right. right? an absolute mm-hmm. genius, but, you know, a, a, a tortured genius when I met him at the time. I don't know what he's like now, but he was great. He was just fucking off the wall. I know he drastically offended my auntie and uncle. <laughs> <laughs> truly. truly. Um, he was basically saying that my uncle was punching above his weight and that my auntie was hot as <laughs> They were in their sixties. Right. <laughs> Sounds like Tom. My cousin sitting there all raging. <laughs> but Tom was really kind of his time, and then we tried to cast. We tried to cast somebody to play my manager, and it was always a, a guy. And and our heads when we were coming, who's this guy that he can be at loggerheads with, and and you know arguing with and stuff. And uh, we auditioned a few guys and did some workshops and stuff. And it just there was there was too much of that. Mm-hmm. The, 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 I, but then I was like. We should audition some women because the the, the the relationship that they've got that we saw with with, with Laura and Tom uh, was like that, but it was a lot more round the houses. It was it was you know she had to manage them really manage them mm-hmm. at times you know and so we asked Laura do you fancy coming in and auditioning and she'd never done any acting before you know mm-hmm. and and she was phenomenal. I mean she's just a great talker anyway. Laura is is one of the funniest 
most uh, generous talky people that you will ever meet. So she was never short of a, of something to say in an improv, mm-hmm. and it was it blew blew her minds. We spent a ha- an afternoon just improvising scenes with her, and we were like, yeah, of course she's she's got to, and she was up <laughs> for it, and she played the part. It was great. It was fantastic. Am I right in saying that you you still kept your toe in it after the film? A wee finished. bit because when we were touring with the film, uh, going to film festivals in Canada and and America and stuff. Uh, I would try and do a bit of stand up in all the places that we went to. There's actually, I think there's some footage of me doing stand up comedy in Canada oh, online. Just man. Seen it the other day. Oh man, it's <laughs> so fucking cringy. <laughs> it's so fucking cringy. It's, it's all true though, it's absolutely true. That I, I hadn't, hadn't written anything, right. didn't know what I was going to say because I never wrote anything in the film either. I would just go up and improvise all the comedy on uh, on, on camera. Really? We'd, go, we'd, we'd kernel some ideas together oh, and go, well, that would be funny if I talked about that. But never wrote anything down, didn't learn anything, just would go out and... It's an old Billy Conley way, isn't mm-hmm. it, man? You've got an idea, you've got a story, just right. go and tell it and embellish it as you see fit while you're doing it. So mm-hmm. that's what I tried to tried to do. Uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But you're doing it on film, so if it doesn't work, there's lots of shite in the can and all the best <laughs> stuff went on the film. I genuinely thought it, it was written by somebody in the game. No, well, uh, Laura and myself and one of the stand-up comedians who appears in the film, uh, Parrot O'Hara, uh, is... We would sit and we would and they would go and they would help me work through ideas and they would go well what about this other uh, stuff got written for me and I would read it and I would go I can't I, this isn't the guy this isn't the character mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like something he would say <clears throat> it's kind of hard to put somebody else's comedy into your act mm-hmm. I know a lot of uh, a lot of comedians will have people write stuff for them and stuff but I, I found it really hard to kind of to use that and, and make it sound like it came from me. Aye. So we would we would sit up and we would drink a lot of wine <laughs> at night with this or we would go out into a comedy club and we would talk about stuff and then I would jump up on stage and I would try and tell stories based on the th- stuff that we were talking about, the Yupon stuff and, and, and all that. You, you know? remember Yupon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a true story. That that is absolutely <laughs> absolutely true. Somebody <laughs> told me that. Right, and I, and, <laughs> and then I just embellished it into that it was me that saw it. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, the, with the soak and on the fanny and stuff, it was. It's, it was I mean, I'm not getting into the new, right? <laughs> but you know, you have to go and watch the film to hear the you <laughs> porn stuff. Uh, it was, it was, it was pretty, yeah, uh, it was pretty graphic. Like, okay, that I but, was, I was fancied it. I was fancied getting a bash. The in fact, both acting and stand up comedy. I wrote about 15 minutes of material about two years ago and then I, like, I, set, I sent some emails out to clubs. What stopped you? I don't have any fucking emails back now. <laughs> there's loads, of, there's loads of, there's loads of open mic nights that you just rock <clears> up and say I've got five minutes. 15 minutes is a bit too long. They're not going to, I mean, Frankie Boyle really will get 15 minutes when he was starting out, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's that age old thing as well though. The more I read what I'd written you just start, start doubting yourself. Yeah, of course, of um, course. Just, that's that's why I like the, the idea of uh, bullet points certain things true stories about yourself because you don't need to write that shit down right. your most embarrassing true story and if your mates find that funny then the audience will probably find it funny Aye. you know I should tell a story about the time I shat myself at work right, that was, that I'm it. Laughing. and I told the cleaner <laughs> I'm laughing already <laughs> what? are you shit trying to shit yourself <laughs> No, 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 that was a different time. That was a, that was a lot of time. How often does that happen? Uh, so, aye. So moving on to these two. The wee man and the yeah. Ed. Right, no, obviously. Oh, look at this. He's in there. <laughs> sound. Aye. Aye, sound. He's a sound guy. Uh, I'll go to the wee man first. Now, mm. obviously, going back to the fact that you grew up in Glasgow and you grew up basically during all the stuff that was Yeah, I remember on. reading about it in the paper. Aye. Um, now, w- watching the film and obviously the making of stuff that I've seen, it's quite clear that Paul Ferris himself had quite a, a hand oh, in the story. Well, it's based on his book, isn't Aye. it? So, uh, <clears throat> what was the question? It seemed to be, it seemed to be pretty flattering for his point of view. You think? <laughs> Just a tad. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you remember what it was like at the time, the stuff you were reading about and how it right. reflected on him. Here's, here's the interesting thing, right? Because I've got loads of, loads of pals and family members and stuff that, that just fucking love a good gangster tale, right? Yeah. And they'll read all the books and they are right into it and they'll know all the names and all that, you know? And there's other guys that are in the film that could tell you every name, you know, all these guys, stories about them, the gangster culture and all that. 
I'm the one of the people. Mm-hmm. I right. couldn't give a fucking shit about <laughs> gangsters. I really couldn't. Uh-huh. It's not my life. I, I avoided that my whole life growing up in Castlemilk. Did not want to get involved in gangs? Did not want to get involved in any of that shit? I just wanted to hang about with my mates, listen to Bob Marley, smoke a bit of a, a, wee, a, a, bit of a joint and fucking just stay out of trouble. That's all I wanted to do growing right. up. So I never, I, that's not my thing. Right. You know, so for me it was purely from the script point of view when I was asked to do it. I'd already done a film with the same guys. I'd done The Lonely Place to Die. And when I auditioned, it's a good, it's a really good wee film in it. And when I auditioned for that, uh, they they said to me, oh, we're doing a fucking movie about fucking Paul Ferris. (laughs) He's like the fucking craze to you Scots, isn't he? (laughs) And I was like, no, to me. I really couldn't tell you anything about the guy. I don't know anything about him. Do you know what I mean? I'm sure there are people who feel that way. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about two different eras. You can't be saying, uh, you can't draw the comparison, the craze. Everybody says they kept crime at a minimum because everybody was scared of them. And, you know, it's a different time and it was a different place. You can't mm-hmm. liken the two. But, you know, the, the Cockneys loved, loved their gangster stuff. They make about 700 gangster movies a year. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> we, we've made one. Yeah, you know, We've made about five. And The Wee Man is one of them. Aye. But we had to go to London with the, with the Cockney filmmakers to make it. You know Aye. what I mean? What do you think of that decision? Well, you know, it, was, it was Glasgow City Council, and no, just didn't want to even do it. Was it? I mean, that's what I was told, but I have no idea. I mean, it was uh, certainly. I have no idea. I go wherever people want me to go. Do you know what I mean? If they're paying me, and they gave me this, well, this is different. This is different. <laughs> they have forced me. Honest. Uh, so I got the script for that, and I read it, and I loved the character, mm. how it was written, regardless of whether it's true. No biopic that's ever been made has told you the truth about every character in it. (laughs) But what I liked about him was I felt sorry for him. I I really felt for him. I felt that he was a really sympathetic character. As much as he was uh, portrayed as this arsehole, Mm -hmm. uh, I think that he was going through a lot of shit. I I think that to be usurped by somebody, for somebody to take his... Uh, seat at the, the old man's See that right scene. hand and, and uh, to be I mean there's so much powerful stuff in there for me mm-hmm. to get my teeth into as an actor I, I was like I want to play this part mm-hmm. as it was written mm-hmm. I was asked if I wanted to go and, and meet his family and talk to them about him or go and meet people and I knew people that had, I knew ex-coppers that had jailed him uh, uh, and guys that were in the jail with him and they were all I'll tell you I, mean, I, went, I don't want to know right. I don't want to know I don't want I don't want this story or that story and all this stuff clouding my mind mm-hmm. Oh, I'm concerned with this script that I'm being paid the money to portray this character. Mm. And that was the safest bet for me to do it. I didn't want to have to start going into the, the, the director or the writer going, actually, so-and-so told me that he wouldn't have done this. Or uh, so, you know, that, yeah. that's a minefield. Uh, hey, I, I, I'm not big enough an actor to pull that shit up. <laughs> <laughs> they would just go, fuck up and do your job. <laughs> B, uh, there's not enough time. Uh, I, w- you know, I was only on the job for a couple of weeks. And, and you know, I liked what was there on the page. Yeah. I, I liked it. I think it was a sympathetic character. I think it was. You do feel sorry for him. See that scene you know? where you know you, you're in your dad's face, and you're like, you, he's you're grooming him to take mass. Like I could see in your eyes, the baggage on your shoulders, on that character's shoulders. Like completely. That like, was just fear because I was terrified that Patrick <laughs> Bergen was going to break my back. I fucking knew it. I said that to you earlier on. I was like, you asked Jim, but he nearly fucking did. Yeah. I was terrified because he nearly broke my back and he shoved me into that thing so hard and it was, ah. there was no playing on that. He was what? fucking hurting me. <laughs> he, he's, he's a big man. Oh, wow. He's a big, big man, you know, and and uh, he was, uh, yeah, he was, he was a unique individual um, to work with, you know. And I, I, I was when I found out he was playing the part, uh, I thought, fucking hell, man, that's the guy that was in the other Robin Hood movie, you know what I mean? And, which is the one I liked. I liked the other Robin Hood movie better. And uh, you know, Sleeping with the Enemy, and uh, you know, yeah. such a, a brilliant career back yeah. then, and I hadn't seen him with anything for years, and then I uh, got to work with him. Nice. And it was uh, it was mental. It I mean, was the maddest experience ever playing his son. It yeah. was fucking dangerous. <laughs> I was, there was times where I was sitting working with him going, he's going to fly out this fucking table and not fuck at me <laughs> any minute. And I'm going to have to fight Patrick Bergen. <laughs> so I thought I was going to have to fight him at some point. Good for the was, was there some kind of like a... Some kind of friction there, or was it just his presence? Was just uh, no, I think there was a, an element of friction uh, there. You know, it was it was. Uh, it was uh, it was interesting, you know. I think yeah, he was he was really into playing that character. Mm-hmm. I was really into playing mine, 
We right. weren't hanging about with each other, you know. We weren't, we'd sat and had a drink in the bar one night and uh, and, I, and I was like, nah, I'm not going to sit and drink with this guy right. anymore, you know, because I really don't want to be, like, I don't want to get into that pally thing, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, I, want to, I want to feel that kind of right. tension between us. So that it felt very real when we were doing it. No, you know? I mean, the way it comes across, is, is, he is like a scared wee boy in front of his dad. <clears throat> oh, aye. Um, I mean, I was never scared of him, let's get out fucking straight. <laughs> <laughs> I take Patrick Bergen in a heartbeat, he's 70 year old. <laughs> However, <laughs> no, he'd have crushed me with one horn. But it's the last time I watched it in the, the bit where Junior demises. Is that no. what? Meets his demise. It's a fucking word now, isn't it? It's a word now. <laughs> so, um, but it was the first time, I've seen it loads of times, so I was like, I own the fucking thing. I've seen it a, num- a good number of times, and that's the first time I ever felt kind of sad at that, but I was watching it in a different way, and it's happened since having my son. It's whenever something bad happens, you go, that's somebody's way. Mm-hmm. The fact that obviously it's based on... Parents so, so how, old's your, how old's your kid? Six. Ah, oh, it'll go with that. Wait till they're a teenager, you'll be like, ah, fucking kill him! <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, but no, it's, 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 a, it's a cracker. Um, what, what was it like working with uh, John Hanna? Uh, well, I know John. I've known. I did. Uh, I did the very first episode of uh, Rebus, Rebus yeah. with John, uh, and he's. Uh, he's. We've both got a, a, a mate who has been for when he was young. Is a really good mate of mine now. So we've got a, you know a wee link there as well. You know, but I've worked with John a, a few times, mm-hmm. and he's a he's a he's a cracking guy. I like John a lot. You know, he's got. Yeah. He's, a, he's a very he's a lot, very funny man. I like that touch of cloth that he did. I, I, do you know, I've not seen it. I've not, seen no, it? I haven't seen it, but every time, every time I even look at the title, I have a chuckle. It's funny. So it's done its job, isn't it? Honestly, it's done its job. There's a bit, I can't even, there's one specific bit I remember. There's a police car pulls up and it's got unmarked police car written on the side of it. <laughs> That's the kind of level we're talking. It's, fucking, it's so really naked funny. Gun. It's like naked gun-esque <laughs> love, guy. Love, love. Um, naked gun. So I, I, it's, a, it's a good film. Um, and it's, well, it's going to stay much. in my collection for for a long time. Um, well, I, you know, I enjoyed making it. I enjoyed the the time we had on it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of good friends made on that on that job. You know, mm-hmm. so. I think like, and I even said this to my wife as well. I was like, you can you a good movie like needs a good bad guy, and you, you the way you played that character was like if if we'd gone out for a drink. I know I'm going to get my head kicked in because I'm with you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, did the, you know the someone? The most dangerous. Aye, absolutely. Oh, did you know someone that you based that Lots of people that I grew up with. Yeah, and you did know? you base that? Because you had that very... Uh, yeah. No, I, t- I think it was just every element of me that I would ever be too scared to show. Uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Everybody's got the ability to be a total cunt. <laughs> Uh, but you never show it, you hide it all, do you know what I mean? You don't say all the bad things. And it's nice to be able to act out and be that kind of... That guy, no. uh, but I went growing up in Castle Milk, man. I, the, you know, there's loads of people like that. Uh, there was a guy that used to hang about, at, and he was just you know big pigeon chest and storm about, uh, you know, wee man syndrome, and you just see him knocking fuck out of people <laughs> every couple of weeks. You'd be like, oh, there, he's knocking fuck out of somebody again. <laughs> Get, you know, and, and but the rest of the time we would be all right with us because we were a lot younger. Do you know what I mean? Be like, all right, all right, boys, how you going on? And we'd be like, I fine, great. You know, I'd rather have you on my side than no. And I think that's you know, you'd rather be his mate than his enemy. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Well, so, based on how he goes about it with his dad, I don't know. Like, well, well. <laughs> but there was lots of guys like that uh, in any any scheme anywhere. Mm. You know, or, or you know. In the world, there's mm-hmm. loads of people like that, right. and I think it comes through fear. I always like to think when I read it, I was like, he's kind of he's kind of half Fredo for the Godfather, and half Joe Pesci for Goodfellas. Hi, Do you know absolutely. what I mean? He's got elements of both of them, and it all comes about through fear. Funny he's how scared, uh, you know? <laughs> yes, he's that guy, but he would only do that in a room full of people that would back him up. So he would never do it one on one because he's a shite bag. Aye. Aye. In the script, as I say, I don't know what the guy Aye. was like in real life, but in the script, that's Aye. what he was. Um, it's, it's hard to believe that you played a character called Fat Boy. You're, you're looking quite, quite trim these days. I put a lot of weight on to do that. I did. Uh, I, I put about two and a half, three stone on just to do that part. Fucking good fun, isn't it? Uh, it was put, put it, it on the uh, putting it on. I'm still trying to get it off now. That was like <laughs> fucking six years ago. Do you know what I mean? Seven years ago. <laughs> it was, but you know, if you're going to play a guy. 
we've called that, then you've got to put the effort in, you know. So pizzas, <laughs> biscuits, you know, lots of booze. Uh-huh. Uh, just oh, shame. Uh, all yeah, yeah well, yourself. but the thing is, I had to pay for it. Oh, it's not like the gig. <laughs> it's not like Marvel's on the phone going, you're going to play a hero called Fat Man. We're going to pay for all your food for a year. You know, I had to pay for all that. It's fucking expensive. <laughs> what? Bought and paid for. Oh, um, no, Ned's. Um, is it Mr. McLeod? Was that his name? I think so. It's been a long time <laughs> since I've seen it. Aye, well, I think it's Mr. McLeod. Aye. Aye. What was? Did you have any kind of basis for that? Basically, because yes, my it teacher for the primary school, my teacher for primary school was my basis for that, Mr. Torrance. What a great name! It's probably it is. Oh God, for age. Oh, well, he's maybe dead. He, no, he's dead. <laughs> maybe he's not. Maybe he's, he's watching this. Well, maybe he's watching this. I was looking after a hotel in the North of America. Uh-huh. Torrance. Ah, shiny fucking hell. Ah, yeah. Anyway, back to That's Mr. Torrance. I feel like be a stand up comedian. I see why you didn't. Uh, yeah, but my teacher, Mr. Torrance, was Flash. He's down in a garage, I think, and he always came to school in a different fancy motor every day. Don't know who he was trying to impress. It's St. Julie's in Castlemilk. <laughs> uh, we'd turn up in like a Porsche one day and a, you know, a Jag the next day and stuff, and you'd always think, God, oh, this. He's really cool, you know, and uh, it, it was just, it was a big guy, I suppose all guys were big when you are at primary school, you know, and it was a very imposing figure, uh, very much you would think a ladies man and stuff, now we're going back actually, you know, a good maybe decade or so prior, so Ned's is set 60s, isn't it, it's a 60s film, and uh, so I, I tried to think, well what would he have been like if he was if he was teaching in there, this, the moustache is real, Right, which I just like to point out yeah. the moustache that I've got in, is it? in Ned's, it's right? Belter. But I was doing a lot of cycling about, and my moustache went, my beard and moustache went ginger. The only time it's <laughs> ever been like blondie ginger, it's never been like that before, oh, it's never been like that since. It was just weird. It was very sunny summer, lots of cycling out in the sun a lot, and it changed colour. And we went in and out, they were like, oh, he had a full beard. And they were like, well, I don't want a beard because Paul's already got a beard. He's playing the other teachers. He's got a full beard now. All right, beard off, right? Okay, well, I'll what about sideburns and beards? So we started kind of playing about <laughs> shaving bits after going, no, no, that's no working. Went down to the tash and I was like, I really need to keep the tash. I mean, come on, he's like, but it didn't work with the kind of brown hair and stuff. And up on the thing, there was that that wig was sitting there. And I was like, ah, that looks the same colour as my tash. And they were like, no, it does. Let's bring that down. I think, I think it's a woman's wig. <laughs> you know, it's supposed to be like, have a big beehive or something like that, but we can comb it out. As soon as they put it on and kind of brushed it out, and I was like, that's the guy. I knew exactly who the character was. I could see him, yeah. a total douchebag, you know, smoking in the playground in front of the wings and all that. So it was great, and Peter, you know, I love working with Peter, because he just lets mm. you, it lets you kind of express yourself and have a lot of your own ideas, and, you know, and you can it can chat away about stuff with him. He's not too precious about his material. Lots of bits of improv, lots of bits of... Uh, stuff with the kids and that just to kind of keep them g'd up and keep them interested and right. it was great fun it was brilliant I loved playing that character at a lot of, I think it was only about two days I was in doing that but it was a lot of fun aye did you ever did, did you ever actually manage to scale the wings yes oh, good it's <laughs> the bit where the boy gets the belt <coughs> and uh, Peter takes me in, in, into another room and the wee guy that's getting the belt and he's like come here and, and here and we go and he goes right listen we're going to have a fucking argument, me and you are going to fall out in front of all these kids, right? So I want you fucking really don't, just let me have it. Fucking call me a cunt, fucking oh, whatever you want to do, right? And we're going to have a fucking fight. We're going to fall out and we're threatening to sack you. And I'm like, interesting, tell me more. We've got two belts. We've got this belt, which is the real belt, crack, mm. out of the desk. And we've got a fake belt, which is already in your desk, right? Now the fake belt is like a bit of foam. You'll no feel it at all, we man, don't worry about it. And we guys like that. This is amazing. He's like, and, uh, no, yeah. no, just in the back, you know. He's through the looking glass, looking at how we're going to fuck with all the other extras and all the other <laughs> actors and the crew and stuff. You know, they knew what we were talking about. And he's like, right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get them. You're going to refuse to give him the belt. You're going to refuse. I'm going to threaten to sack you. You're going to go, right, fucking fine. But I'm on my phone to my agent. I'm going to fucking contact his parents. And you're going to get done for this. You're going to get done for this fucking day. So, <laughs> so we date. We go out and the wee guy's like, hey, says, you in wee man? You, can you date? And the wee guy's like, I'm totally date. I'm brilliant. <laughs> so we storm out of the room. And I went, no, I'm fucking doing it, Peter. No way. No fucking way. That boy's family's going to come after me, no you, I'm the one fucking assaulting them, a police will be the door, like, fucking day, it's your job, you just get it fucking, so we had this huge barney in front of everybody, and all the way, so I said, no, the 
<laughs> and it's so the big band right okay fuck it fine we're doing it I'll say I'm not fucking happy about it so the belt goes in and let out what one's the fake ones make sure they <laughs> fuck that up that'd be amazing that would have been brilliant wouldn't it? but they all think this is a real because I'm hitting it after this you want me to hit my this crack and all, <laughs> the noise you know what I mean it's like no way is he going to ever going to hit me <laughs> so we go and we do the scene like you get up here right fucking take the fake belt out and fucking horns up and a, a proper right up in the sky leather because that's what Mr Torrance used to date yeah, as you know he never held back when he were getting the belt I was on the cusp I got the belt and the ruler and the oh. stick and stuff on my hands and that when I was at school and I know what it felt like uh, my brother got it for being left handed <laughs> witchcraft is that what they thought witchcraft <laughs> he, he, my, my big brother's nearly 50 so he was still it was still about no uh, yeah he, I was on the cusp but they stoked it when I was maybe in primary 4 right so this wee guy comes out and he gets the crack and he gets a crack and I went, fucking dear, crack. And I turn out and he crack. And, and then I turn out and he goes, you fucking happy? And he went, aye, that was brilliant. And I went, well done. We went, all the wains ran out of their seats. Choose your horns, choose your horns. <laughs> and the wee guy went, aye, dingy, <laughs> to the It was fucking hilarious. Oh, so the camera was never on us. Aye. It was never on me. It was never on the kid. The camera was shooting past mm. us through the horns and all their faces to get the reaction. So oh, that right. whole thing was just to get their real reaction at watching somebody getting hit. Wow, it's brilliant. Boy, what it a great... Is. What fucking... What fun. Yeah, <laughs> what a great way to earn a living, hitting wins. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do, you, do you think he was a, a bad bastard, or do you think he was a bit kind of downtrodden? Uh, I think his wife's left him. He sits and eats a tin of beans at the tin every night. You know, the, the, he, was, he was just a good teacher much maligned by horrible students right. which I think now that I, I'm married to a teacher is to, I, I nailed it <laughs> do you know what I mean I, I nailed it uh, you know I, I, yeah, I think he thought he was a great teacher I think he, he thought he was doing everything right but mm-hmm. he was in the remedial class he was teaching the ones that weren't good enough for this guy next door Aye. you know and I think that really that was the thing that, that made him turn to drink and hate kids and hate his job well it, it's a it's one of these films I found that go better every time. It go better every time I yeah. watched it. The first time I saw it, I thought it was all right. And the more I watched it after, I just, there's a lot just of subtleties in it. There's a lot. Aye. I see the way that it ends. Uh, you know, a lot of people are like I don't really, I don't really get it. I went, mean, man, if you don't get that, the lions. If you don't get that, don't worry. I'll look after you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just so good, and the and the performances from that young cast. Uh, it's a testament to to, uh, to Lenny who kicked out who, Lenny mm-hmm. Peter's brother who casts uh, his films and uh, and Peter and how they can work with these these young guys and get just incredible performances mm-hmm. of them. They speak the language. They know what they're talking about. Uh, do you know what I mean? I'm uh, right in saying that quite a lot of it was kind of autobiographical from Peter's point of view, or certainly some of it. Well, you'd have to speak to Peter about that. Uh, as far as uh, you know, I wouldn't like to kind of answer that for him but yes I think certainly it was uh, there was a lot of uh, his upbringing in that film it's from a place of uh, of truth mm-hmm. you know Aye. but as far as that go, I wouldn't I would, I would I wouldn't hesitate I wouldn't <laughs> hazard a guess at how much or, or what parts mm-hmm. uh, going back to A Lonely Place to Die for a minute because I forgot to bring that up before then that was that was really good one, th- one thing I loved about that film is how music can make you look at something completely differently. Like they could show some of the shots in that film of Scotland and it, like oh his majesty in the Highlands. Show that with some nice music and yeah, that looks gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Show it with some ominous music and yeah, that's fucking scary. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really it really kinda makes you feel like you're there for a lot of it and um Well they were, I mean they, yeah. see the thing about the uh, the director uh, Julian Gilby and Will Gilby the director and his brother mm-hmm. learned to mountain climb like properly climb mountains to do that film right he was hanging off of mountains they were they, you know out, they, they did all this before I came on to the job because yeah, I came on after they shot all that stuff because they were like if we're going to kill a famous actor we might as well date early in the shoot for some reason <laughs> but they they knew they, they are like uh, as far as I'm I'm aware that's that's their bag now. You know, certainly Julian's bag is to is to go and and shoot things on the side of mountains and stuff. You know what I mean? He's mm. so into it. Aye. And and I think this was the film that really got them got them into how to do that. You know how to hang off this because he was doing that shit himself. You know the director was hanging off the side of mountains and it's quite an interesting fella, Julian. You know, I really enjoyed working with him. It's, it's, it's quite a quite quite a unique approach. Aye. You know? 
I remember him, uh, it was <laughs> first day on the job, I got to the woods and he, uh, and he went, oh, so I bring over my, my storyboard and I'm thinking somebody's going to bring her this wee thing for me. Fucking two guys over this enormous storyboard and stuck it up against a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he starts talking me through every shot and all that. The camera, the lens is going to change here, and then we're going to be doing all that. And we're going to ins and outs, and we're going to zoom in here, and it's going to, oh, it's going to pull out to this. And I'm just like, I'll just act, man. You do, you put whatever camera on me you want. It's not going to change what I do as the character. You know, I'm not going to be thinking, oh, this is a, you know, certain millimeter lens they've got on here. I better act a different way. You know, just do the same thing. But it was really interesting, you know, he wanted everybody to be so involved in his process, mm-hmm. which is, is quite quite uh, unusual. Do but you find that, like, when, like, from all the different projects you've worked, that no two tend to be the same? It's always dependent on who's leading that, you know, that... Yeah, because the, the amount of people, you know, it, it, uh, a village is created with a different person at the, at the head of that, mm-hmm. and how they act trickles down how how, uh, how everybody else acts and, mm. and so on and so on so yeah every every job's just a little bit different mm-hmm. and that's why you, I mean if, if you today this and every job was the same it would become like a job mm-hmm. you know right. which is exactly the opposite of what I wanted when I was wanting to be Burt Reynolds <laughs> you know, when I didn't <laughs> want to be I want to be you know challenged and excited by the people that I work with all the time so there's lots of different people there's always that, that new uh, exciting thing to to get your teeth into, which is the people running about you that are doing it, mm-hmm. you know. Imagine it doesn't feel like work for you because you're doing something you're passionate about. I mean, well, uh, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, getting the work is the work, you know. Yeah. That's the chore. Right. That's the hard thing. That's the hardship. That's the you know <clears> you're sitting and you've no work for a year, and you're you know you start taking jobs in in pubs or starting to kind of apply for jobs at the post office and stuff like that and you think you're never going to do it again and you're kind of ready to leave it behind and that's happened several times in my uh, career you know and, and every actor's career almost every actor if you're if you're not lucky enough to be one of the the top percent you know what i mean mm-hmm. you, you'll always have those doubts and you'll always have that's that's what makes it really difficult mm-hmm. what, uh, but it works your, so i'm sorry you'll carry on uh, what, what's been your worst period of that um no, not that long ago, you know, not that long ago. I applied to a job in the post office and then get a letter back saying I was underqualified to deliver mail. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Which is true because I've done nothing. I've not done anything. I'm no one. I, I, I wanted to do this when I was 12 year old, mm-hmm. you know, and I did everything to do this job. Um, and I was very lucky that I got into it and I, and I did it, you know, and, and I, the minute I started getting paid to do this, I haven't done anything else. I've done bits and bobs, bits of bar work, bits of this, bits of that. Mm-hmm. But I've never done anything that would be long enough on a CV. So if I did write a CV to send away to an employer, it would be all my acting work. I mean, what, mm-hmm. you know, what's that, what relevance does that have to, to anything else in the world? You know, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's quite weird. Do you sort of, feel that you're... That your best work is ahead of you or behind you? Oh, for fuck's sake, ahead of me, man. If it was behind me, good. Good. Uh, maybe, you know, <laughs> of course it's ahead of me. I mean, I've yet to be in a Marvel film. <laughs> you know, There's plenty of I've yet to so... be in a Batman film. You yeah. know, I, I, until I, I do all these benchmarks, you know, one movie, mm-hmm. then uh, one thriller, The Lonely Place to Die, I wanted to be in. I wanted to murder loads of people in a film. Mm-hmm. I just always fancied being a masked killer. <laughs> I got to wear that pig mask and shoot ah, people. Nice. That's. Bucket list. Yeah, I've never. I'm a huge fan of horror and science fiction. Mm-hmm. I've never done a horror. I've never done a science fiction film. So until I do them, and until you know, until that happens, I'll be plugging away at this. You know, do, and do you know something? I started writing a script Aye. about eight years ago, along the kind of horror lines, and at the time, the person I had in my mind for it was James Nesbitt. Aye. Right, just because he. His age and the way James Nelspert. My invitation Jim. definitely said elves as they're all dressed <laughs> up as Elvis. <laughs> Where's adverts like that anymore? They don't exist. Well, no. I'm, right? I'm He's a, an elf in the Elvis. I might revisit it, finish it off, and send it on you. I do that. I do that. Always willing to read scripts that are never going to get made. <laughs> it's we- one of my favourite pastimes. <laughs> No, yeah, if you got it, you should you should finish it. I, I'm, I've got loads of unfinished scripts, man. I'm a frustrated script writer. You know, I've lo- wrote loads of shorts and stuff like that. And mm. you know, one of these days, one. Of, I mean, that's kind of what I want to do. You know, going forward is to to write and direct and do that more. You know, you know, Brian Cranston's big work didn't come to near the end. Like, 
of his life, which he's not. Obviously, he's not at the end, isn't he? But you know what I mean? To the later parts of his yeah. life. And he, because I read his book and he talked about always being passionate, which is like yourself, always being really passionate about the work he was doing and never chasing the money, never chasing the success, just passionate about what it was. And then he, he guides you through his journey as to, as to his understanding of acting. And then out of the blue, because he'd worked with some Vince Gilligan on the X Files, he gets a call to, to go and audition for Heisenberg. And now he's, you're literally. It's amazing because they didn't even space. want to audition him, did they? They didn't want him. The producers were just like, no, nah, he's not the right guy. The Daffy, Malcolm in the Middle, what are you talking about? But I mean, he was great in Malcolm in the Middle. It was I'm amazing. Just, he was Did you see this episode oh, when he was on the roller skate? <laughs> it's one of my favourite <laughs> favorite episodes of. Uh, I love that. <laughs> yes. And he is, he is one of the actors that you look to and you're like, ah, yes, okay, you know, just, just do the work. Uh huh. You know, I liked his ethos about auditions, man. Don't worry, don't worry about what they want. Mm-hmm. Just worry about what you can give them. Yeah. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because you can only give them what you can give them. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? You know, no every actor can do everything. If they like what you can do, then you'll get the thing. But if mm-hmm. you don't, you know, that it's not what they're looking for. Right. It's, 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 it's tough. You know, that that's a tough ethos to have in your head. Yeah. Easy advice to give once you've been Heisenberg for 10 <laughs> years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but he had some... But he, had, he had his lower moments. You know what I mean? So he, he really... And I read certain parts of his career. He thought, you know, should I try something else? Um, his his dad was a a, a wannabe actor. Didn't really do much. Um, and then when he'd become Heisenberg, he wanted to do this this uh, script that he'd written for him and his dad. And his dad wasn't interested in it because there was no money in it. Do you know what I mean? So he always kind of followed that that same passion. And and again, most of the mo- the most successful people in any kind of you know any any kind of outlet. Is they've always followed their passion. Mm. I think you know with your work, you can see that you clearly are passionate about your roles. Like you're a perfect dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> and you know That's what? One of the nicest things anyone's <laughs> ever said is, to me. I, I I've I've said for so long that a lot of the stuff that we're seeing these days, you don't you don't always get the best bad guys, do you? No. And in order for a, a film to have you know your Luke Skywalker, your Darth Vader, you need to have that balance. There's no point having a Luke Skywalker without a perfect dickhead. And I always said as well, a real bad guy should kill a kid. Did you see that Jack Black movie with the uh, with uh, the clocks in the wall? What is that called? The house with the clocks in the wall. I've not seen it, but uh, big major bad guy comes back after thousands of years. Can't even kill a kid. <laughs> That's the Voldemort syndrome. Can't even kill a kid. Oh. Well, fuck's sake. You watch it. He kills kids. Pennywise is straight in there. Pennywise is a straight up scary bastard. Right, and it, that, oh, and I think you you're really really good at that. Just that dickhead. Well, I don't have any qualms about <laughs> being a dickhead. Do you know what I mean? I don't get a chance to be one in real life very often. So it's great that. to get a chance to be a bad guy. I mean, I love comedy as well. You know, mm-hmm. I love. I think I've got a fairly good understanding of timing and mm-hmm. and how to yeah. make people laugh. And I think this same ethos goes for being. A dickhead and yeah. a bad guy and something, do you know what I mean? The timing and stuff is all it, it's a similar thing, you know. You, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's like when you played Junior Thompson, you you were a baddie and you were threatening. Like you like you just you never, never knew what he was gonna do. But like you said, you did you do have that kind of soft spot for him as well. He's um, a cow you know, it, it's certainly the way that I play them is you'll only ever see him being tough or hard when there's harder, tougher people with him. Mm-hmm. We never see him do that. Uh, on his own he when gun. he's left on his own with his dad or when he's mm-hmm. in the motor and it comes to a fight and there's three of them and two of them he's a coward mm-hmm. and that's and ev- even the scenes where he's trying to be you know show off and be the hard man he's only doing it because there's yeah. harder people there that will yeah. protect him if it goes right. sideways yeah, a lonely place to die you're just a proper fucking body you know <laughs> in addition for that they asked me which one of them I wanted to be you know what, right. what one of these characters would you like to be and uh, Sean Harris is a fucking heavyweight actor, you know, <laughs> he is brilliant. And uh, I think I might go talk to him, I quite liked him, you know, he's a tricky character, he's a tricky customer, you know, he's really very kind of intense. Mm-hmm. But I really liked him. And I, I, I get talking to him and I was, I was like, ah, fucking, no. they asked me what one of these guys I wanted to be and I was like, Are they get to do all the talking you know, the cool kind of scenes, or kill everybody. And I was like, is it kill everybody and say nothing every time? <laughs> no lines to learn, just look mean and, and brandish weapons. I've mean. never done that. I've never done that before, you know. It was great fun. Aye. It's the biggest my beard's ever been, I know. <laughs> I get beard envy with other people and I'd like grew that for about three years. <laughs> three years for that film. Oh, it's ridiculous. We were talking earlier on about 
a, an absolute favourite of mine that I've seen recently, and it's the one where you play a barber. Oh yeah, yeah Barney Thompson. That's <laughs> a great wee film. Is it the second aye. time you work with Robert Carlyle. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Lonely Stone Place did that, uh, not uh, Stone of Destiny. <laughs> yeah, Stone of Destiny. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I've known Bobby uh, f- uh, for years and years, and uh, you know, in and about. And uh, his wife used to be uh, uh, a makeup artist, so mm. I kind of met him through her. She did a, a couple of films that that I had done, a couple of jobs. Uh, so I kind of, I kind of knew him a wee bit, and then we did Stone of Destiny and got to kind of. Hang out and chat and stuff. He's a he's a, he's a lovely fella. Ah, he's a good guy. He seems right. pretty sound. Yeah, uh, he's a good guy. I, I love the. I mean, the storyline was class. Just like the accidental serial killer. It was. But really the books funny. are supposed to be really good. I've mm. never read the books, I but there's know. a series. Ah. Of, there's a series of Barney Thompson books. Right. Uh, so if they do any more of them, I'll fucking not be in it. Were you the first or second? I was the first. You were the first, oh, and then because it was yeah, I was the first. And again, like Bobby, like Peter, was open to as a director was just open to your ideas. Because so I had my hair was a wee bit longer, and I'd and I'd grown these sideburns, these connect kind of straight. <laughs> well, I grew, I did the beard, but I had the idea of of cutting them down into this thing with the tash and quite rockabilly as I wanted my hair and a quiff and Aye. so it's like what are you thinking about the character and I went he's a rockabilly he's an old rockabilly he's a rockabilly hair and the, the sharp sideburns and winker, winkle picker shoes not it went brilliant make it happen uh-huh. great and that was it and he, as soon as you get that, that leeway to kind of develop how your character looks you instantly know how he acts mm-hmm. you know you're putting him into the, the, the kind of shoes of that guy and it was great working in that barber shop was brilliant a lot of those actors were just were sitting bantering or the guys that were just sitting getting their haircuts oh, yeah. in between takes would be sitting saying the fucking funniest shit <laughs> and I'd be going like that I'm going to say that when we do this scene and they'd be like aye have it really? aye you were just stealing all their shit do you know what I mean and they were so up for it because it was like they couldn't say it in the scene yeah. do you know what I mean because the scene was us talking yeah. and, and bantering about you know what I mean mm. So right. they would be, they would be like, "Ah, you fucking have it," you know what I mean? And I was like, "It's brilliant." It was just a gift that kept on giving that job. I really enjoyed it. It was great fun. Uh, Emma Thompson in it was fucking phenomenal. Aye, she's she's Emma Thompson playing an old Scottish woman. Like, Emma Thompson that never that broke character ever. Uh, Did she know? First time I met her was at three in the morning outside the Barrowlands. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the scene, I think I was just a deep body in the motor at the time, and I hadn't filmed anything yet. And I'm like, You're just going to come down, get put in a bag, and be a deep body. And put in the motor. I was like, I need to three in the morning. Like, Great. And we're sitting in a wee tent outside, so there's loads of paparazzi about and trying to take photos and stuff like that. And so we're sitting in this wee tent, and like, hey, Emma, this is Stephen Stevens. Like, all right, son, how's it going? And we're like, totally in the character. And I was like, All right, yeah, it's nice to meet you. And she, Sitting chatting away, and she was like, Do you want, you want a cup of tea? Why go and get a cup of tea? And went, Hi, so the tea's doing here. Uh, I was like, Right, well, let's go then. And she fucking starts shuffling. Like that. And, I, and I was like, Are you seriously going to fucking shuffle all the way down for the tea? All right, all right, all right. This, is how, this is how I walk. And I'm like, It's fucking four, like half three in the morning. Shuffling down the street outside the Barrowlands with Emma Thompson, kidding on she's an old woman. <laughs> You know, those are the things. Those are the, the things that just keep you coming back for me. Yeah, but even when you're out of work for a long time, and you know, you always know that there's always a story like that yeah, around the aye. corner. There's a moment like that to be had. There's joyous work to be done. Mm-hmm. So you just stick with it. Do you know what I mean? Because that, that what, a, what an amazing night that was. Just, <laughs> just that you think. that first scene in the film when you're pushing Barney further and further back in the barber shop, and uh, he, he's like. He's like and then he asked the boys, right, who's next? And they're like, no, I'm just going to wait for Stevie. Or He's like, why well, you don't want to hear a cup of me? And it just kind of escalates. And he turns into Begbie. Just <laughs> just for a wee minute. He said, <clears throat> he's like, really? He's like, you're not going to get your hair cut, baby? Baby? <laughs> so he's like, it's fucking Begbie. Uh, that's Bobby Carlyle, something else. Love to speak yeah. to him at some point. That'd be amazing. Yeah, ah, well, you know, you can but ask. Aye, I mean, aye, uh, he, 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 would, he would love this. I think he'd love aye. this. It was a good wee chat. Aye. Aye. I mean, well, well, hopefully he comes back and does more films. You know, he was a great director. I really enjoyed working with him. I hopefully mm-hmm. he does it again. You know, it, it would be it would be great to see him behind the camera. Again, he could do Taggart with it and have you playing somebody else. He could be, aye, he could be McVitie. He could be the, <laughs> the young McVitie. <laughs> Jojo McVitie. There's a there's the scene in uh, Wee Man, and I asked Jordan this question today. I was like, "See that part where you get shot in the ass? Mm-hmm. Like, was there a was there an explosive pack in there, or was that no, CGI? my ass? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I, like, I wonder what that feels. I don't get paid that fucking much. <laughs> 
no, no, there'll be a stunt double in for that. <laughs> no, no, no they, 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 so the yeah, the squibs on for the yeah. getting shot part, right. and then when I was doing, it's just added in later. There was right. a blood pack in there, so the guy could bust it with a gun as they poked me right. in the bottom. And this, I've got a wee thing there as I'm lying. I can ah, pump it right. out, you know, so you wow. just see the blood seep out on his. On his anus. Uh, his anus. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and that's a fucking horrible way to go, isn't it? That's a terrible, <laughs> terrible way to go. And I was lying on the street at like, I don't know, fucking two or three in the morning <laughs> in London in the freezing cold, just lying there with blood seeping out everywhere. <laughs> it's great fun. <laughs> These must be like, because we, we've only done very minimal filming. When we've done some of the, the horror cons and stuff, we would film small adverts and we spend our whole day and I think to myself, like, we're having so much fun just filming small little teaser trailers mm-hmm. for our audience to see that we're going to Manchester um, and we have a theme to it and whatnot. And we have so much fun filming that stuff or when we're at the conventions and we're coming up with ideas on, on the spot. It must be, and, and I will say, it must be great to be paid to do this kind of stuff. Like, because it, it literally is playing almost, right? Well, yeah, yeah. I suppose so, but there's also a weight of responsibility with <clears throat> people. That's what I'm saying. When you're an amateur and you're doing mm-hmm. stuff off your own back, and yeah. you know you're doing short films with people, students and stuff like mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. there's a freedom to do, you know, to really explore what it is you want to do. I think that's yeah. why Nick Cage does so many kind of B movies because mm-hmm. it's Nick Cage, right. and are you going to start telling him what he's doing is wrong? <laughs> are you going to tell him no? To go, oh, you're not going to tell. <laughs> you're not going to tell him anything. You're just going to let him do what he wants. I think that's why he does so many and he loves the freedom of it oh, yeah. whereas when you're getting paid and, and there's a lot on the line there's a lot of people looking over your shoulder there's a lot of people critiquing uh, stuff and uh, you know telling the director this isn't it you know there's a lot of people to be responsible for there's a lot of money that goes into these jobs you know mm-hmm. sometimes hundreds of millions of pounds mm-hmm. and so the weight of responsibility you do feel you still have a great time and you have a good laugh but when you you know you need to get that right so there's a huge weight of responsibility of getting it right. Mm. You ever had a moment like when you've been halfway through filming something when you're just not sure of, about if you're yeah, getting it right? Yeah, every single fucking time. Uh, man. Of course, every time. I mean, you, I would love to be so cocksure in my own abilities. Uh, you know, but I've said, I think from quite a young age, doing this job, I have to rely on my director to tell me if I'm doing it right or doing it wrong. You know, it's hard to be objective of your own performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so that's that's the thing that's why your director's there and hopefully some of your, your co-stars as well uh, or fellow actors will you know go what the fuck are you then <laughs> if, <you're>, if you're really <laughs> off if you're going off piste you know yeah. okay. but you have to rely on your director to, to, to guide you mm-hmm. but he's hired you to do the job because he thinks you can do that job so there's a certain element of the, the balls in your court let's run with it wherever mm. you go but you'll you'll work on things in a day I, you know it, it's it's horrible it's hard when you do if you do a scene and you have to go all right okay right let any wants to change almost everything about what you've just done you're going oh i've pitched that so wrong there but mm. really the differences are very slight yeah but you know enough to make you go fuck i need to rethink my whole thinking of this character now, Aye. you know. It's not happened very often, but, you know, it can happen. That's their job, to, to think of the bigger picture. And if you the, what you're doing, your little bit of uh, madness doesn't fit into his jigsaw puzzle, then mm-hmm. you're going to have to rethink it. Aye. But generally, it doesn't happen. And they, they hire you for a reason. You are, that's that's <clears> the persona that they're looking for. You, every character's not a million miles away from, Aye, from who you are. No, no filmmaker wants to go through the Eric Stoltz Back to the Future scenario. I, I don't, fortune. I don't know when I mind Eric Stoltz's career, <laughs> even, oh, with, even, right, with, even without Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah. Not what I mean. yeah that's the thing. He is really. He's if Eric Stoltz had gone on to, to work in McDonald's, mm-hmm. then I would feel really bad for him. Do you know aye. what I mean? But Eric Stoltz <laughs> went on to have an amazing career. So, aye, aye, you know. He still worked out. Yeah, he still worked Just wasn't right for that. Wasn't right for that. And I think that's probably. Michael J. Fox was brilliant. Yeah. Michael J. Fox was brilliant in everything that he did, you know. Frighteners. I love Frighteners as a The dog's running away with my face! Absolutely. <laughs> Do you it? It's all falling apart! I love that film. It was amazing. So Danny Elfman does the music. I remember showing it to my kids and them being terrified with it. Ah, no. And I, and I was like, oh my god, it's, it totally is really scary. <laughs> It is properly scary. That's Peter Jackson. Is it Jake Busey ah. that plays the plays the serial yes. killer? Ah, yes. Was, yes. I was in a party in his house once, and ah. it's a tell story for our time. Oh man! Fucking hell! Jake Busey. Well, we'll do it next time you come. Then. <laughs> 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 hey, 
or the bad stories. <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is a bit where we just ask you what kind of movies you used to you loved when you were coming up. Yes, Animal Run was obviously one of them. Lost Boys. Well, we we were <laughs> actually talking about that. I had a film. A mate of mine who's a film critic. Are you alright there? <laughs> give me that. He's doing an improv. There's nothing, there's nothing there. Nothing there. <laughs> where did you bang your elbow on? This, this oh, mirror or the mirror. This oh, is it normally hangs up there, but because of that monstrosity they reflected and I had to take that's it down. That's crazy. It's like a <laughs> fucking Starship Enterprise. Huge <laughs> <laughs> big light. Uh, so it was interesting because on uh, this week's show, uh, Escapism Artist, I interviewed a mate of mine who's a film critic and we were talking, so we talked to movies and the films that he's slightly younger than me, so the films he grew up with, the films that I grew up with. Uh, me and my brother used to get videos all the time, so we had an Azad video shop, uh, right, yeah. just just round the corner from where we grew up. Uh-huh. But before Azad, Azad was like a revelation, a shop that was just for videos. Before uh-huh. Azad, it was the uh, Drakemar Cafe round the corner, which was a grocer shop, right. that one of the was was just loads of videos, uh-huh. right? Uh, back in the day when it was just videos, just VHSs. And, it, and there wasn't that many, um, like, good films. They were all B-movies, mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that, you know. So, like, stuff like Jake Bu- uh, uh, Gary Busey and Hyder in the House and, like, horror, schlocky horrors. Um, Peter Jackson's Bad Taste. Oh, man, uh, Brain Dead. Loved it. Uh, brain Damaged. <laughs> uh, you know, it, we love our horrors. We love those kind of weird, off-the-wall horror movies. Uh, yeah, so stuff like that... Um, my f- my dad was one of the first people on the street to have a, a Betamax video <laughs> oh, recorder, man. right? And so the house was like always full of people going, oh, put that movie on again. And there was like three movies or something they had with it. But the, those three films I watched religiously over and over and over again. Uh, I own all three of them now. I still watch two of them. I don't watch the other one because it just doesn't hold up. Which one? So the one I don't watch anymore is The Warriors. It doesn't Bad hold up. Play. Right, it doesn't hold up. Nah. That which you felt was scary when you watched it then is the worst piece of acting you've ever seen now. <laughs> it's <laughs> just rubbish. <laughs> uh, it's it's camp, it's catch, it's it's got it's got its charms, don't get me wrong. I mean there's a reason why people still talk about it now. The soundtrack, the girl on the on the radio, mm-hmm. all those really cool things about it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's so a beautifully homoerotic, <laughs> you know what I mean? which there's nothing wrong with, but it's not hard gang men gang. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's so over the top and and kitsch. It's so it, it, I don't think personally that it really holds up over mm. time. I think mm. it's very much of its time. And if you want a wee bit of nostalgia, you'll go back and look at that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the other film which I do think is one of my favourite films of all time is The Wanderers. Mm. Uh, Never seen it. Oh my god! You got to watch the The Wanderers is like. I watched it again recently. I used to tell my wife about it all the time. We're going, oh, this movie and this one, oh, it was great. I can't find it anywhere. I've, I've looked in all the shops, you can't get it. So one birthday, a copy of it on DVD. And I went, oh, and I was kind of resistant to watch it. I was hesitant to watch it again because <laughs> I'm going, this isn't going to, this uh, isn't going to live up to my expectations. Uh, you know, how, how it made me feel at the time, better. I understood it more. Uh, I got it. The acting is brilliant all the way through it. Every character. It's about gangs in the 50s mm-hmm. in New York but the gangs are really just uh, kids with identity so you've got the Italian gang you've got the black gang you've got the Chinese gang you've got the Spanish gang you've got all these different gangs that all go to the same high school right, right? and they and they're kind of always want to fight and rumble <laughs> with each other you know and uh, it's just a beautifully observed piece of filmmaking. It's really funny. The soundtrack is outstanding. Right. And if you watch that now, you'd go, this is where Tarantino gets a lot of his stuff. Yeah, eh? really? The use of music in film. Mm-hmm. How to use it, how to set up all these things with music. Is, it, he must be a huge fan of The Wanderers. He must be. Because yeah. I look at that and I go, if he'd went back in time, this mm. is the film Tarantino would have made wow. back then. It's funny that he is a master of using music that shouldn't fit. And making it fit, but this all this all comes for the time. This is all music that they would be listening to, but mm. it's of an era where all the music's just fucking shit hot. I mean, it is, <laughs> it's just brilliant, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's Frankie Valley, it's all that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, but all the characters in it, the story of it, uh, is just amazing. So the two, the, the the black gang and the Italian gang are going to rumble. They're going to go for it, <laughs> you know, and and they're all trying to kind of uh, enroll all the other gangs to come and fight on their side, right. you know. So there's so trying to uh, certainly it's about the wanderers. Wanderers are the Italian gang, uh, and they want to try and get more people because they know they're going to get their asses kicked. <laughs> 
by the black gang. Uh, but the the businessman, the big Italian businessman who is the father, the gangsters, the father of the guy that the head of the gang's going out with, yeah. has an idea. He says, no, you're going to play each other in a game of American football. We're going to bet on it. You better win. So they're forced to not fight, but to play a game of American mm, football. Right. And then at the end, spoiler, there's an enormous fight. Breaks <laughs> out on, but this is like 400-odd people on a football field uh, brawling. It lasts about 10 minutes. Oh. It is outstanding is it's any, amazing any big names in it or is it um, the, do you, I mean I couldn't pull the names off the top of my head just now because they're not they're not um, like household uh, names for me <clears throat> uh, except for uh, um, Indiana Jones's girlfriend in the first film Karen Allen Karen Allen mm. is she kind of she, she's kind of like dropped into it Right. And kind of upsets the balance of everything, you know. She's the kind of bit older. She's it's so good. It's it's really really. Want to take more then? Ah, yeah, please do check it. Out. It's absolutely brilliant. It's one of my favourite films. And the other one, Shogun Assassin, Shogun. which I've watched about a million times. Aye, again, never. I know that one. No, I've heard of that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was a bit from about six year old. I used to watch that every single day. It was banned in fifty countries around the world. You know, it was like 50, or fifty states or something. It was like one of the most banned films of all time. Aye, super violent. Uh, it's got one of the best, so it's totally dubbed, uh, but but the dubbing is what makes it amazing. You know, the guys took, so it was, uh, there's a series of films called the Lone Wolf and Cub series, uh-huh. and they must have filmed them all, and they're all about fucking two and a half, three years long, but they filmed them all back to back, because it's the guy and the kid, and the kid only grows up in small increments for each film. Right. It, not even that much, but it's the same kid in all mm. the films, and mm. they, 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 the samurai goes on this journey with his son and the pram is made of weapons you know and there's just like there's <laughs> fucking blades everywhere <laughs> that sounds and like a kind of thing I, 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 there's people trying to kill him there's this all the way through it's just all, all these assassins that are sent after him and nobody can get anywhere near him the guy's oh, just man. a master with the sword yeah it is absolutely brilliant so robert houston took the first two movies edited them down into one film and that shogun assassin oh. put his own uh, dubbed soundtrack on top of it got the most amazing person this kid to do the voice of the kid, mm-hmm. and that's what makes the film. This kid narrates the whole film, oh, and it yeah. is just eerie. It's beautiful. It's yeah. the the fights in it are so balletic, so poetic. Oh. It's a beautiful film. It's hard to get dubbing right. Have you it, seen? It's, most of the time, dubbing in these films is is laughable. Well, it's perfunctory. Um, it just serves a function. It's not there as part of the movie. But what they do with this is they make it. They, it really, it's part of the film. The film mm-hmm. wouldn't work without this specific. Mm-hmm. Overdub. It was one thing that always got me about uh, Way of the Dragon, right? Bruce Lee, Way of the Dragon, and he's in Italy, right? And he's talking away in Chinese to Italian people, and they don't understand them, obviously. But when they dub it all in English, it doesn't make fucking sense. <laughs> so he's, sit- he's sitting at the table. She's like, hey, "Can I help you?" And he's like, "Eggs." <laughs> and she goes, "What?" It's like. Eggs. Like he's just stupid, <laughs> or she's stupid. It ends up bringing him five bowls of soup. It's like, it doesn't work unless he's speaking Chinese. Yeah, yeah just a funny wee side note. <laughs> I, I love the idea of getting the, of being one of the guys that did that as a job. Aye. You know the guy who the, you know there's a, I think there was there's a guy who dubs Arnold Schwarzenegger into Austrian for his films, what? right? Allegedly, right. allegedly, right? Now Arnold Schwarzenegger is Austrian. Uh, could dub it himself, <laughs> but doesn't, because when he speaks Austrian, he's got a really funny voice, <laughs> right, so, Bumley, when Arnold Schwarzenegger talks, he talks about that, when he, when he talks in Austrian, right, he's got a bit, he's got a, he's got a funny voice, this is what I heard, so there's another guy that dubs all these movies and he's got a really suave Austrian <laughs> voice, Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't he sound like that, when wow. he's, because I think he's from like a, it's maybe like, a, a, he speaks quite with a Casimilk accent, you know, mm. I mean like proper Ouija, ah, yeah, when he mean. speaks Austrian, do you know what I mean, because yeah. he's from a tiny wee village, out ah, in the yeah. sticks, so when they date, they'll probably get somebody that's from London, the, the Austrian equivalent, you know what mm. I mean, he speaks very proper, and mm. you know, ah, it's just I quite mean, interesting. A year ago I could have told you the name of the town he was born in, but I forgot. Ah, I think the older we get, the more... Like I used to be able to tell you every actor's name, and the 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 older I get, I tend to lose all the words I'm trying to say for some reason. Yeah, that's that's yeah, an age thing. Is that? Yeah. You've only got so much room in your brain. Aye, that's it. I used to hit off anything. Someone say a movie, I'm like, right, that was made in 2018. 
and that's got this, 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 this guy in direct by him. Like you've got a lot on your plate now, that's right? maybe successful, what kind of whatever this is. Still never made a penny. That's it, we've got the opposite thing. It's like the thing that we are passionate about is the thing we don't have time to deal with. <laughs> that, like you, you had stuff you were passionate about and you had the time to be passionate well, about. Well, I made sure that I had nothing else in my life. Aye. Do you um, know what I mean? And this, but this, only, this whole thing only came out because we sat next, like you, like you said to you earlier on, yeah. sitting next to each other at work and then just started blathering. And People like, found it entertaining. This, this could be gathering around to listen to us to talk about movies. Brilliant. That's all we spoke about was movies. You know that the, the stereotypical, you know, pals in a movie where they get together and they they put a tape on <laughs> and they just talk about movies and it's always like that's exactly what we've got going on um, and, and Brilliant. we love doing it so that's why we try and do it well it's great best. fun I mean I will, I will listen to one of your podcasts now that I've met you uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. I might just listen to more than one uh-huh. to be honest that's, you know, I'm not just going to listen to one <laughs> I won't listen to this one <laughs> sake, do you never no listen way. to yourself back aye and do you want- <laughs> yeah, was, I'm joking <laughs> Do you watch yourself? Funny is up. Before you were going to cut that back, you fucking pair of bastards. No, I will dub it. I do a dub it. Please dub it. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. The radio show. Um, when did you start doing it? How long ago? I did it. I started doing that last year, probably around about the March, April time, around about April. Mm-hmm. And that was a thing that I wasn't getting a lot of work, and I was feeling quite uh, frustrated. You know, when you're used to being creative and doing stuff, I used to have the improv group would, mm-hmm. would be the great thing for that. I'd meet up with them every week and you would just get that outlet and never did you get post-job depression or anything like that. But when you don't have something uh, like that, post-job depression is a very real thing for actors. Mm-hmm. It certainly is for me. Mm-hmm. You know, as soon as I finish, I'm part of something and it's and it's very intense and it's, and it's amazing and then all of a sudden it's over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have something else... Uh, that can get into your psyche a wee bit. So I wanted to, and it's a charity that runs it called Healthy and Happy uh, for uh, Rather Glen and Campus Lang, where I live. And and it's great. And then the, the centre of the, the charity to get people involved, and it's got this whole building cafe and stuff like that, is a radio station upstairs, and it's a proper mm-hmm. FM licensed, of course, a proper broadcasting radio mm-hmm. station. And it's run by mostly volunteers, a couple of full time. Uh, people to run it but mostly volunteers so if you want to go and be part of that you can go along and help out in a myriad of ways and when I went along I, I was happy to do anything and they were like well you train in the radio station everybody trains in the radio station that's our main focal point of getting bringing people together and my mate had done a show with him for a, for a couple of years and I'd been went on as being a guest so I was no stranger to the, the building and the people and I uh, pitched the idea I was going to do, do a music show because I'm heavily into my tunes you know I love my love my music uh, a DJ, often, uh, as often as I can, and uh, and my wife was like, no, nah, man, you know all these people, all these actors and writers and directors, interview them, do, mm-hmm. do some sort of show with them. So I just basically stole Desert Island Discs <laughs> <laughs> and turned it into my own thing, the yeah. escapism artist, and you know, come up with fantasy film soundtrack, which is, you know, it, it can be hit and miss because it's quite difficult. Uh, people feel a weight of uh, responsibility like somehow they're going to be cast up in years to come that, that you, you come up with that idea or that was shite or something <laughs> uh, but mostly when people just go with it and have fun with it you know uh, for me music's really important so when I listen to music I'm always seeing and, and I'm always writing down mm-hmm. ideas for films or writing scenes for things and music's a big part of that you know so as soon as I hear a tune especially for the first time I think what, what kind of film or scene mm-hmm. that would fit with and so that's it's born out of that to get people to do that and it's such a good time getting to know people that I already know a little bit mm-hmm. but really getting to know them better because mm-hmm. I forced them to sit and talk to me and nobody else but I know so it's great fun and, and it really is that thing that helps me yeah, um, stay uh, connected to uh, something that's a little bit artistic and you need to really think about it and you mm-hmm. know and editing it down and stuff like that it keeps me busy and uh, yeah, it keeps the keeps the demons at bay, you know, so yeah. to speak. So uh, you know, I think everybody needs something like that. Oh, absolutely. That's yeah. what I want that fucking light. Every time <laughs> it's something that. else. <laughs> you can probably see the reflection in my glasses. Look at the fucking size here. Yeah. <laughs> when Seb was setting it up, we were going, Seb, could you know I brought a bigger one? It's, a, it's amazing, honestly. I've got. I want one of these for doing self tapes. It's, uh-huh. it's absolutely stunning. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, 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 
It's definitely serves its purpose, I hope. Uh, this, <laughs> is, this is building up the stock we need for the, the doc documentary. Yeah. I tell you what, you could, you could shoot a feature film with what you've got there. Just, right. just write it and shoot it. Ah, so you write shoot. it and shoot it. Aye. Aye. Right, it will make it in your man hut out the back. Aye. We'll just go there and we'll make your film. Aye. Uh, the, so the radio channel is Cam Glen Radio. Cam Glen Radio, uh, it's 107.9 FM. Uh, you can listen online on camglenradio.org. There's also a mixed cloud page with a lot of the former shows on there. So you just need to go and search for the Escapism Artist. Mm. There we go. Uh, I've had people like Peter Mullen and Richard Rankin from Outlander on it, and mm. uh, you know. Johnny Watson and uh, Adam McNamara and stuff. It's, it's, it's great. It's a great Kate Dickey's episode is, is brilliant. Her music choices she's were just really good. She's phenomenal, you know, and she did a great show. We had to edit hers down a lot. We sat and spoke for about two hours. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, she's lovely. She's a good friend. And uh, yeah, was, it's just good to get your pals in and just for uh, a reason and have a chat. What was horror film she did? The Witch. Was, was it The Witch? Uh, or Witch? Witch. Aye, uh, it's, not, it's not The Vivitch. It's not that one. It was a, it's a Scottish film, right? Um, and it's fucking mental. <laughs> I just don't remember it just being bananas. Uh, that's oh, I can remember about it now. I just remember it being nuts. I just remember her name, Kate Dickey, and this crazy horror. Um, it's it's it's. I'm sure there's some shape shifting and stuff goes on in it as well. By oh, memory, I don't think that's the witch film I'm thinking. Of. I don't think it's shape shifting. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I'll leave mm. fucking check. I'm edit cut, that cut, one. Cut, I, I, edit all of that. Out, <laughs> and, you know, let's just go back to Kate. Is, Kate why is, is it always my shit that has to get edited? <laughs> if you listen back <laughs> to the episode, funny. right, you'll hear Jordan go off on a tangent, and he'll go, "Oh fuck, just edit that." <laughs> <laughs> and I go, "I did that on the radio show." So <laughs> right, I'll never edit. And I'll go, "I'll edit that out, mate." And then I don't do it. I don't do it either. So he's all thank fuck. <laughs> we, we did a we did a, a special episode on the end of the still game, uh-huh. right? And I spent most of it fucking greeting, right? Because it, it was it just hit a lot of nerves, right? For whatever reason at the time, and uh, like there was just moments of silence where I'm like, for fucking 30, 40 seconds, and I'm like Kev, you'll need to sort this out. He's like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, though, what I found, though, is we had a, a lot of good response from our listeners saying, you know what, I thought I was the only one crying for ages. And they heard Jordan babbling like a wee girl. He should always leave that <laughs> stuff in, you know. I Aye. mean, it, 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 it's real. You know, don't date with, like, audition tapes and stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> leave it another bit, going, ah, fucking fuck, fuck that up, didn't I? <laughs> Which I'm always tempted to, though, you know. I'm always tempted to send them in because there's that human element that you don't get from a, yeah, a self-tape. It's all very clinical. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, try to be the character, mm-hmm. send it away. Whereas if they saw all the stuff, uh, getting ready for it, fucking it up a couple of times, try to do it again, you know, discussing it with the person you're reading with, which makes it sound like you're in the room. It's yeah. very tempting. But then you think you get a phone call for your agent going like, ah, what the fuck are you doing? So you've, just ruined that. you've just ruined that whole thing. Nobody <laughs> wants to self-tape over you again. Nobody's got time for that. You know? I think, I think, like, uh, with regards to when, when I don't edit him out, when he's like edit me out and I'm like straight up I'm like that was funny I'm keeping that in I think it offers more it offers more do you know what I mean well you know you don't want it to be too clean and too clinical do you You want it to have warts and Uh all you know warts and all and you're only babbling like a couple of fucking idiots so Oh, then I've only listened to 10 minutes (laughs) worth so you know the 90s have been alright you're not babbling like idiots (laughs) Um, have you got anything upcoming that you can talk about? I know. Uh, I'm on. Uh, I'm working. I'm doing a, a wee short, which is quite interesting, called "The Grief That Stole Christmas." I'm doing that uh, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm filming that in Livingston for the. Oh, what's a, 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 oh, a student it? student film? Mm. Uh, which should be good fun. Uh, and then on March, I start on a show called Vigil, which is shooting uh, at the moment, uh, which is a new six part cop drama. Right, mm. uh, set in Scotland. And can you tell us what you're doing in it? Uh, 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 I'm in it. Uh, I'm in it. <laughs> and I'm playing a politician, <laughs> which is a departure for me. I've never played a politician before, so, so you, you can, can still bring a dickhead. Do you know? uh, uh, exactly <laughs> what I'm I know you're making a dickhead. I'm trying to know you're making a dickhead. Um, yeah, so the, you know, there's. I, I went. I went for the copper. They offered me the politician. Right. So clearly, I play a copper like a politician. <laughs> so the lesson learned for the future. But it's a great cast, and uh, it's shooting just now. So it'll be, uh, you know, at some point in the future. But right. yeah, so it's nice. I've known about that since before Christmas. Uh, I did. Uh, I did Brassic, uh, which is on Sky. Uh, 
first series was just being on, the second series is about coming on, I'm in the second series of that. Yeah. It's uh, a very funny show. And uh, and I did the second series of Save Me, uh, right. which is called Save Me Too, which yeah. is not a funny show. It's a very serious drama, uh, and it was brilliant to be part of it. The first series was just phenomenal. So I'm in a couple of episodes of that, and that was just before the year. So it's like all of that came at the end of a really dry period, you know, and right. just sticking with it. And I was so close to a couple of really big jobs, you know, and, and even had like phone calls from the people that didn't cast me saying it was literally down to the wire. And it's, you know, you can be so close to something. Mm -hmm and no get it and it can be quite soul destroying but then you just need to persevere yeah mm -hmm. and rely that you know if you just keep doing what you do that, that things will come along so i've had a good wee period there's a lot of stuff coming out at the tail end or midway through this year that i'll be on telly and everybody will think i've got loads of money because because <laughs> there's loads of because i've seen you on the telly three times this week uh, you must be minted you go aye last year <laughs> i can spend it on it <laughs> so people think they see you in the telly go oh, you must be rolling in it yeah, uh, they were filmed three years apart. <laughs> they? That's, that takes ages for them to uh, come on the telly or be in the mm. cinema. Um, if you could see, if you've got, like, if you got a crystal ball, right, and you can say, right, I, I can insert myself, right, into any kind of franchise, any role, or even create your own. What would that be for you? Like your ultimate. <sighs> I would. I would love, and I and I have tried to write stuff along this out, but I, you know, I would love to be. A, a a touch of frost or a, ah, or, a or a or a or a tag or a you know hard nosed damaged flawed good guy oh, yeah. anti hero House. do you know what I mean yeah, yeah yeah like a cop thing you know what I mean I'd like it to be really violent mm -hmm. and on the edge and funny and you know all the things that everybody wants to be in a you dickhead know, all everyone loves a dickhead <laughs> a lovable dickhead. <laughs> It's what I'd Just like to be. I'd like to be a lovable dickhead in a series that probably went on for about ten years and oh, bought me a house. Yeah. <laughs> That's what every actor wants, though. Everybody, yeah. don't they? They don't even care what the part is. Yeah. Are you, you never know? tempted by just a straight down the line nice guy? Uh, I, I will play anything for the right price. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's not that people. I, I've done the straight down the line nice guys. You know, I played a a, a part in a thing called The Key years ago, BBC drama, and. You know, I think my character went from 18 to, like, 48 with not a fucking bit of makeup. <laughs> Seriously, oh, 18 right. to 48 with not a bit of makeup. Wow. I just had to change the, the kind of how I played the character and... And I was at BBC, I was like, not any sticks and fucking wrinkles on me. They were like, no, you look tired enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so and he was a really nice guy, and it was, you know, it was lovely to play. All all characters are lovely to play if they're well written. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, if the if the writing is is hokey, it becomes really difficult. And especially if you're playing like a smaller role and it's not really well thought out, and you're just there to serve a function, mm -hmm. that can be quite difficult. Uh, but anything that's well written, I'm happy to do anything. Like mm -hmm. This short film that I'm doing, you know, there's there's literally zero money in it, but it's really well written and it, and it sparked me as I've got and I don't really say that much in it but I've got one of the best lines <laughs> that I've ever said at the very end of the film and as soon as I read that I said yes I'll do that uh, so, yeah. you know because it's that's what it's about I think it's a, if you can if you can find people that write nice things and, and they're happy enough to work with me then I'm over the moon to work with mm -hmm. them you know and okay. I feel very fortunate to, to be able to work with talented people <laughs> well we love what you've been doing and we hope you keep Absolutely. doing what you're doing. Thanks very much. Um, I wish I could say the same. About, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I've not listened to much of your stuff. It's not that I'm saying you are shite. <laughs> what I mean is, I, 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 no, I, I'm out straight back at you. This has been a lot of fun. No, sitting in chat. Th th again, thanks very much for coming. It's been superb. I've and enjoyed uh, it a lot. Aye, it's look, been good luck. look forward to what you've got coming up. Yeah, yeah. Get me on the podcast next time because I'm a lot funnier when you can't see me. <laughs> hey, mate, well, we'll do that. Absolutely. Right. Especially when you new stuff coming up as well. Um, come on and promote it. I mean, we, we we always tell our audience, even just the average listener, if you want to come on and tell us something that you've been up to, you know, something that... that no, I'm, no I'm the average listener. <laughs> the special guest, the average <laughs> listener. It's a fickle world of the show business, isn't it? <laughs> See? I, I, um, well, that went well. <laughs> so, no. so, again, thanks very much, and it'd be great to have you on again. We'll do the podcast. I'd love to do the podcast. We could even great. come at you and do it. So. Great. 
I mean, uh, thanks very much. Brian, thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. So we hope you guys have enjoyed that amazing interview with Stephen McCall himself. What a, a very gracious guy to come and you know we're just two wee daft podcasters that make no money and pay no money for these guests, and yet he came out of his way to come and spend the evening with us talking absolute jibber jabber. But um, he made it amazing. I think we made it amazing. Nah, I'm only kidding. He made it amazing. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great time. It was a great experience for us. Uh, it was amazing to be part of that. And you know, big shout out to Stephen McCall. Um, for giving us his time, he didn't have to do it. You know, he's a, a budding actor that has uh, much more creative things to do with his time than give it to two wee dafties, but he done it. So be kind, everyone, because that's what he done and that's what we should all do. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, it, was, it was actually even, the, I don't know if you heard that there was a genuine moment of concern when he was worried about my elbow. Um, <laughs> I happened to scalp it off the fucking mirror that was sitting behind it, my, my chair, <laughs> and he was like, You all right there, man? I was like, hey. So, um, yeah, Stephen, thanks again for coming. You, you were a legend. Um, we hope to have you back on soon. In fact, we don't hope you're fucking coming back on soon, oh, mate. I know. And that's exactly. and that's that's just the way it is. And uh, name any of these fucking close encounters lights right in your face. <laughs> you're just going to be you're going <laughs> to be sitting sitting in the man cave, surrounded my, by my DVDs and a brick wall and a curtain. And we're just going to shoot the shit and it's going to be the boss. So thanks very much for coming on. See, before Frank. we finish this episode, I need to just tell the audience this, right? So, for all you that don't know, right? And this is a, this is great that you've actually stuck with this episode right to the end to get this little piece of golden nugget, right? So, um, and, and, and if Stephen's listened to this episode as well, this is great for him to hear this back. So Jordan, actually, he made this happen. He contacted Stephen's agent who put him on to Stephen uh, and made the arrangements for jo- for um, Stephen to come on this podcast. So we, <laughs> we you know, <laughs> fresh from having all our uh, thousands of pounds worth of equipment for filming this documentary, like, this is going to be great. What we'll do is we'll film it for YouTube. So by the way, if you've listened to this, it will be on YouTube right now as well. So if you want to see that interview, go ahead and Jibber Jabber podcast. You can find us everywhere, social media, blah, 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 Facebook, Twitter. But go to YouTube, check it out. Anyway... So the door goes, right? Let's paint a scene. And, I'm, and Jordan's like, oh, I'm shitting my pants. He's like, I'm shitting my pants. I'm like, oh, he's shitting his pants. Go outside the door to Steve McCall. Go on then. Right, go on then. So he answers the door and you can just hear Steve McCall going, all right, Jordan, hi. And Jordan's like, oh, hi, Stephen. Hi, hi. Acting all like merry and more politer than he ever usually would. And he's like, oh, I just threw this way. Stephen comes in and goes, what the fuck is this? It's all these cameras about. I can tell I was doing a podcast. <laughs> Jordan freezes like he just shat his cell. He's like, oh. <laughs> but I don't mention that we've been filming it. <laughs> and for one split second, we all kind of looked at each other and thought, he's just fucked us. Stephen's going to turn around thinking that we've tried to fucking film a porno or some shit. Or <laughs> inside, I was pissing myself. But, um, but yeah. We a podcast these days. You can film a podcast as long as well as um yeah. as as record one. And we wanted to film it because there's value in there. Um, Stephen's I, I did, it's yeah, a notable I, guest, so we wanted I, to make sure it's filmed. It, it was it was my fault. I did ask a question. I asked asked two questions in an email. He answered one of them. I didn't realise he hadn't said yes to to the filming, but uh, <laughs> I did text I did text him afterwards, and uh, we, we ironed all that out. And honestly, the, the guy's brand new, <laughs> and uh, it's it, it it it's all worked out in the end. And there's there's no there's no hard feelings. And uh, aye, thanks for bringing that up, Kevin. I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking prank. That's what you get for insulting me at the start of the episode, you I didn't. When did I insult you? Ah, uh, fucking. On that note, here's a song <laughs> called Days of Light by uh, Roger Daltrey. Um, Jared, Jared McMahon, G Tom Mac wrote this song, so we hope you like it because you're going to be seeing that in the documentary. Spoiler alert! Enjoy! <laughs> Thanks again. Bye bye. <laughs>